can be uh, for emergency practices, what evidence is out there and how we are doing um, our work. Um, I'm going to just focus this talk purely on these three uh, emergencies because we only got about uh, eight to ten minutes to do. So the renal colic this is probably the second commonest emergency that we come across, and we're going to touch upon four different aspects uh, regarding renal colic. The first one is imaging, whether it should be CT or ultrasound scan as the first modality of choice when someone comes with colic. Um, if you look at the American College of Radiologists guideline, it's more of a consensus guideline rather than a, uh, a clinical evidence-based guideline. And I'll just come to it a bit later why. And they're given a, what is an appropriate score. It was the most appropriate test, and nine being the best, one being the worst. And according to them, CT is uh, the top at eight, followed by ultrasound at seven. So it's it's a very close split between CT and ultrasound there. The STONE trial is probably the largest trial ever done on this, uh, on this clinical question. It essentially compares point-of-care ultrasound done by an emergency physician and ultrasound done by a radiologist and the CTKUB. Um, and if you can see the results, there's basically there's not much difference between uh, all the three modalities. And what's more interesting to me when you look at it is uh, the sensitivity and specificity. Uh, even in CT, it is fairly similar to what you can get out of an ultrasound scan. Um, and that's probably why even this year, EAU still sticks to ultrasound as your initial assessment. But they do say that with the strong evidence uh, and level of recommendation that CT should be used to confirm um, what your diagnosis is. So I kind of leave that there for uh, your uh, judgment. Um, what is the best analgesic you give when somebody comes with uh, renal colic? This is one area, there is so many papers uh, out there, so it's very difficult to interpret or do any systematic review and that sort of thing. I just put one there simply because that's something that we've been involved with. But essentially, uh, in NICE does state that NSAID should be your first line treatment. And in fact, if you look at all this, those papers, um, invariably non-steroidal drugs come out top rather than opiates or other analgesics. And I'll also draw your attention to your first statement from NICE, which does say that uh, CT should be done within the first 24 hours. If you actually look into the evidence uh, synthesis behind this statement, now they have not considered the STONE trial, which I just mentioned about. So they considered quite a lot of other studies in the evidence synthesis. Um, so those are the two. Um, the statements from NICE regarding the two questions we're talking about. And EAU continues to say NSAID is the strongest winner in terms of your best analgesic of choice, and opioids is probably a second choice, but again, the evidence is not that great for that. So once you diagnose tone, what to do next in terms of managing them conservatively? Is there any role for uh, medical expulsion therapy? Um, SUSPEND trial was one of the big ones, but before that, there have been, again, so many studies in this field and we do have a Cochrane uh, review as well, which basically says an alpha blocker uh, is uh, significantly uh, better, uh, gives better outcome in uh, patients with stones more than five millimeter, especially in the lower ureter. Um, suspense studies primarily is not about stone expulsion as such. They consider the effectiveness of it, i.e. the intervention that's required. So they have taken a slightly different marker as uh, the primary outcome. It is also a large scale uh, study. And um, if you look at their um, uh, forest plots of their uh, study report, overall they have said it's not of uh, great use, but again, in the fine um, print, the lower ureteric stone and stones more than five millimeter have again a, a, a statistically significant improved outcome with medical expulsion therapy. Um, there's another study that people talk about this MIMIC study in terms of uh, MET, but I wouldn't uh, extrapolate the findings of the MIMIC for this particular clinical question because that's not what it was intended for. It's also a retrospective observational reporting. There's a lot of data loss in the study uh, because they only studied it as a corollary to their main uh, clinical question. And in spite of all this, even there, there is uh, some evidence to say that it may be beneficial in people with stones more than seven millimeter in size. So EAU continues to hold a strong recommendation to use medical expulsion treatment for stones more than five millimeter in low ureter, which I think is probably uh, is, uh, is the right thing to say at this point. Uh, we know that ureteroscopy has better outcomes than uh, uh, shock trypsy. So in a hot situation, in an emergency situation, if you decide to do ureteroscopy, should it be primary or delayed? i.e. where you just tend them and then bringing them back for a delayed ureteroscopy. 
Um, from cost point of view, doing a hot urethroscopy is much more cost effective. It's kind of um, logically obvious, but there is evidence to say with numbers and figures, what is the extra cost that it, uh, that it uh, happens when you do delayed urethroscopy. Um, in a setting like in UK, because I know in India, it's uh, where we originally trained the hot urethroscopy is sort of fairly routine. But in a country like in UK, again, this was a UK-based study. And again, all the operative parameters when you do a heart urethroscopy are as good as sorry, on uh, doing someone with a stent under delayed urethroscopy. So again, uh, that should be a primary focus uh, as much as possible. Uh, the next one is uh, acute retention, which is uh, probably a still a common urological emergency. Quite a few clinical questions there for me. When you look at it, do we always have to put a urethral catheter? Why not SPC? Why not ISC? Or if you're using urethral catheter, what size it should be? Because there's a lot of technical advantages have come these days. So SPC role um, has, has evolved and it is not like what we used to do it, uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, we're not going into all those details, but just from principle point of view, SPC avoids urethral damage. It gives an early attempt to talk, and more importantly, people can be potentially managed at home if you have an SPC in place for talks, etc. Um, but once you catheterize, um, should we allow it on free drainage for the bladder to decompress, or should we control the drainage of bladder? We do. We have a, actually have an, have an RCT on this, and basically there is no difference between the two. Uh, so it, we should be allowing to allow it to drain freely uh, without any concerns. Um, so once the emergency management is done, when to take the catheter out, most studies uh, look at it around two to three days uh, of uh, waiting time and always with an alpha blocker. And that does uh, give uh, significantly improved outcomes. And NICE do recommend uh, the same thing. A nice touches upon as urethra as the best way of catheterizing, but that probably again to do with the uh, how emergency uh, urology is practiced in this country. But uh, interesting thing to note is that um, you start the alpha blocker a day earlier and then try and take the catheter out within two, three days because the licensed use is uh, only for a period of four or five days uh, initial for the initial management. Um, and they do recommend in the long term that if they fail, then they can go, go on to intermittent catheterization. And a long term catheterization only if you can't do an ISC. Now, I, my logical thinking is why not extrapolate it and offer ISC as an initial um, option itself, which I touched upon three, four slides ago. So those are things that we don't have strong evidence on. I'm not going to go into what to do post catheter removal and failure or success, et cetera, because that's slightly out of our remit. And then the last thing is about uh, scrotal emergencies. Now, the key questions here are who to explore, when to explore, and uh, how to explore and or how to do this to the op. The reason I say whom to explore is because um, we know that uh, practice like UK where emergency sc uh, scrotal exploration is the default um, scenario for a testicular suspected torsion. We know more than half of them are negative explorations. So is there a role for ultrasound first? Well, first with NICE, uh, they say exploration first, which is what we're doing. So that's what NICE says. That's fine. But is that based on strong evidence? It probably it's not. Um, there's, there's a, <clears throat> going back to 2013, the American Association of Family Physicians have uh, looked into the evidence. And the best um, evidence we have is only consensus statement, either for ultrasound first or for exploration first. Now, um, we'll touch upon these things a little bit later, but before that, um, how soon should we explore? We all know we should explore as, as early as possible, but that's the rates that we have that if we lose you know, every hour or uh, every few hours, uh, we do lose a lot of, uh, uh, lose a chance to save the testes. What's more important to know as uh, trainees and um, consultants is, it's not just about saving the testes initially, even if you save the testes, there's an additional 10% loss of testes in the next one year. So it's widely important to consent this when you're doing a con consent for emergency exploration. There are five different ways of fixing the testes and what's the best approach? We don't know. There is no evidence for the best technique of doing it. There's another study which shows that roughly one in seven patients do not have the very classical pain, swelling and tenderness that they expect in a torsion. 
that's probably one of the reasons some of the torsions get missed because the representation is not very classical. There's also something as twist score to predict who has torsion and which testicular pain is not torsion. I would probably say this is best to be ignored and uh, not to use this sort of uh, scoring system. Um, it, it always uh, is, is also, the, the validation studies are not great on it. Um, if you suspect torsion, can you send the patient to somewhere else to explore? Try not to do that because we have evidence to say that trying to transfer patients to other centers actually does have poor outcome. You should always try and manage torsion in order you see the patient first. Um, we did touch upon ultrasound scan. What's the evidence behind it? What sort of scan it should be? How it should be done, etc. Again, the, the results are a little bit inconclusive at this moment. The first, which is the British uh, SPR's uh, research um, um, group, they are taking quite a lot of um, 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 uh, significant steps into looking into these questions. They did send out a, a Delphi questionnaire last year to say how people fix the uh, scrotal exploration. Don't think we have seen the results of it yet, but that would probably give us some indication of what's the common practice that's been around. And this is probably more important. Uh, that's the upcoming study from BURST, um, the DTOT study, where the urology registrars will be trained to do point of care ultrasound when uh, suspected torsion patients, and they will scan it themselves rather than waiting for them to go to radiology or whatever, and then decide on torsion and, and so on. So uh, it's only a pilot study to be, uh, it hasn't started yet. So this in the long term, this is one thing to look out for. It will probably give us more answers than what we have. Finally, um, I have to touch on sepsis because that's uh, one of the life-threatening things that happens in urology. Um, everyone should be aware of signs of sepsis, how to pick up sepsis, what are the clinical signs and symptoms. And more importantly, once you've done that, you need to make sure you follow the sepsis six and finish off this within the first one hour. And failure to do that potentially opens you, opens you to medical legal uh, issues. So in summary, there is a lot of evidence for uh, renal colic management. So I don't see a reason why you, sh you should struggle to know what's the best way to manage uh, stones. But the evidence for torsion is in general at our best is evolving, but there are some promising studies coming up and especially the burst one will give us more answer. But regarding the rest, there are quite a few evidence gaps. So there's a lot of opportunity for people for thinking of studies and um, reviewing literature in these areas that will be of great help for the future. Thanks. Thank you, Gokul. That was a very comprehensive presentation and we will base your evidence PowerPoint as a baseline for the rest of the session today. And I hope the other speakers will keep up with the evidence up to date. And I'm very surprised that uh, the license for alphysicin or tamsulosin is only four days after acute retention, when the common sense says that patient needs to continue for long term. So that's where the evidence is and that's where our clinical practice lies. That's a very good example to take how we handle the evidence in day to day life. Next presentation is from Salil Kankayas. He is one of our interventional radiologists. I'm going to share his slides. His talk is on role of intervention radiology in our daily practice. A big hello to everyone listening in. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Salil Karkhanis. I'm a consultant interventional radiologist at University Hospitals Birmingham uh, in UK. I am grateful to be given the opportunity to speak to you about the role of interventional radiology in urological emergencies. So through the next few slides, I'm hoping to talk to you about what we think are Urological Sir, sorry to interrupt you, we cannot to see explain the Explain to you what is interventional radiology okay. and also describe to you. I will share again. What it has to offer you as urologists to and now? your patients who are in emergency and hopefully yes, uh, highlight some uh, important cases that can reinforce my point. So to start with the obvious question, what is a urological emergency? Now, obviously I'm speaking to a room full of urologists, so I don't really need to uh, spend too much time on that. 
So typically, it is any pathology of the GU system that requires escalation of care within a short period of time. So obviously, if it is a true emergency, the time period we're talking about is no more than a few hours. Uh, if you think about it, uh, the only two major scenarios that fit this form of uh, emergency would be either anything that ends up with hemorrhage or ends up with the GU system being septic. So in the hemorrhage scenario it could be because of trauma, iatrogenic injury, or spontaneous bleeding amongst the major causes, or it could be sepsis, which could be because of obstruction of any cause, hematogenous spread, or spread from a contiguous organ. Either way, you end up with a patient who is critically ill, requires escalation of care, and not uncommonly input from critical care. So that brings us to our next question. What is interventional radiology? So it is the use of image guidance to perform uh, procedures on a patient. The image guidance could be uh, in the form of any imaging modality like ultrasound, fluoroscopy, angiography, CT, or MRI scan. And the procedures would be those performed for the purpose of establishing a diagnosis, um, performing a treatment, whether it's emergency or elective, or performing a procedure to enable other specialities to perform the definitive treatment. So what uh, I think are the benefits of interventional radiology are the, uh, the use of imaging to guide diagnostic and therapeutic procedures for a variety of clinical conditions. So the principles of IR can be applied to various clinical conditions and not just condition specific. It's also not organ specific, meaning that while I'm talking to you about the GU system, the same principles can be applied to the hepatobiliary system, uh, lower limb vascular system, the chest, so on and so forth. It is uh, minimally invasive. So obviously as urologists, you're all used to performing laparoscopic surgery uh, and uh, uh, through keyholes. However, we perform most of our procedures through pinholes, even smaller holes. Uh, so it's truly minimally invasive. And the imaging or state of the art imaging allows precision targeting, whether the targeting is to biopsy a renal lesion or to embolize a bleeding vessel or to perform an ablation of a renal cancer. So in a typical urological emergency patient, your, your treatment options would be conservative, if that suits the patient, do nothing. Medical, which could be antibiotics for sepsis or tr blood transfusion for hemorrhage or proceed to surgery, which could be nephrectomy, partial nephrectomy, so on and so forth. Now, not all patients improve with medical therapy and not all patients are stable enough to go for surgical management. So in the, the, for the zone in between, I believe interventional radiology or IR has a fantastic role to play. It has the benefit of being able to provide treatment options that can be definitive. For example, calculus obstruction or malignant obstruction of the ureter. You could perform an nephrostomy and leave a ureter extent as a definitive procedure. It could be a bridging procedure to allow eventual surgery, or it could be a procedure that is enough to de-escalate the patient's condition and then at a later date, perform a more definitive procedure. If you had to compartmentalize patient GU pathologies, you obviously have those within the kidney, in the ureter, in the bladder, and the final arrow is for anything outside the uh, outside these three. So in the kidney, typically, you could have anything that causes obstruction, such as calculi, malignancy, benign strictures. You could have uh, uh, trauma, iatrogenic injuries, spontaneous bleeding from neoplasms, aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms. You could have obstructions in the ureter due to calculi, malignancy, benign strictures or extrinsic compression, uh, trauma or iatrogenic injury, for example, during cesarean section. Uh, bladder pathology could be due to trauma or pelvic trauma, spontaneous bleeding following anticoagulation and neoplasm, 
or obstruction from benign prostatic hypertrophy or calculi. And finally, outside these three, you could have trauma or iatrogenic injury. So moving on to some cases, uh, you had an 80, this one's a very typical scenario, 88 year old male with CA bladder uh, uh, had uh, radiotherapy for the bladder cancer, which was stopped due to onset of hematuria. Uh, the ultrasound uh, demonstrated moderate hydronephrosis. A CT scan confirmed bilateral hydronephrosis down to a very inflamed, thick-walled uh, uh, urinary bladder that had the catheter. So the purpose was not only to decompress the system, but also give urinary diversion to allow the bladder, the, the radiotherapy cystitis to heal. So you were able to, in the same sitting, perform bilateral nephrostomies and leave drains in for decompression and urinary diversion. The second case is a very complex one, which was 61 year old female known to have ulcerative colitis with multiple previous uh, uh, bowel op uh, operations with uh, multiple fistula. She recently had complex abdominal wall and fistula repair surgery, uh, went into sepsis, had a long ITU stay, had bilateral nephrostomies and ureteric stents in place because of a persistent ureteric leak. We had, she ended up displacing her right nephrostomy and ureteric stent. And the CT scan demonstrated the persistent leak, as you can see, pointed out by the arrow. So what we were left with when we were given the referral was a non-dilated right pelvic ileal system in a patient with quite high BMI with gas in the system, which meant we could not apply the standard ultrasound guided puncture. What we did therefore is took the patient to CT scan and the CT guidance placed a needle in the pelvic ileal system. We were able to then thread a wire into the uh, renal pelvis and eventually transfer the patient back to angiography to complete the nephrostomy placement. This patient was a 32 year old male with a left iliac fossa renal transplant that had a biopsy because of transplant dysfunction. The patient presented then a few hours later with abdominal pain and shock. A CT scan demonstrated uh, appearances of a arteriovenous fistula and a large perinephric hematoma, likely secondary to bleed from the fistula. A decision was made along with our urologist to perform embolization. What we then did was perform an angiography through the transplant renal artery that demonstrated the renal artery and early filling of the renal vein with a fistula in between. We were able to place coils to block the fistula and prevent any further bleeding. Next case is not an uncommon one. It's a patient who had a left partial nephrectomy presented with hematuria and shock. IR were approached in the uh, middle of the night for embolization. As you can see, you got blood in the pelvic epithelial system and perinephric hematoma. We performed an angiogram that confirmed the extravasation and one were able to block the bleeding by embolizing the renal arteries. This was an odd case with a 77 year old male patient who had had a previous cystectomy and an ileal conduit. He presented with macroscopic hematuria in spite of stopping a pixavan. A CT scan demonstrated appearances of a arteriouretic fistula from the left common iliac artery. We were able to perform an angiography which confirmed this fistula there. We were then we then placed a, a covered stent graft across this segment to block the fistula and prevent any further hematuria. A similar case of hematuria in a 75 year old male who was on anticoagulation following a bypass graft, developed, uh, was investigated with cystoscopy but developed lower abdominal pain immediately after. A cystogram demonstrated uh, a, a bladder injury with a urinary leak with the hematuria persisting. A CT scan a subsequent, and a subsequent angiography confirmed a pseudoaneurysm in the vesicle artery branches, which was then embolized with coils and prevented any further hematuria in this unstable patient. Uh, a different scenario of hematuria when you had an elderly lady with a bladder tumor that was bleeding requiring multiple frequent transfusions, we were able to perform a unilateral vesicle artery embolization in a palliative sitting 
and allow uh, uh, the patient to be transferred to a hospice for palliation. This final case is a 45-year-old male patient with metastatic seminoma who had a left orchidectomy and on four weeks later had left testicular pain. A CT scan demonstrated left iliac fossa hematoma with uh, what looked like an arteriovenous fistula. Uh, we were able to get access into the left testicular vein on the venous side and work our way retrogradely through the fistula into the left testicular artery, as you can see here and we're able to embolize the inflow, the fistula, and the outflow in this setting and prevent any further bleeding. So the learning points so far are that interventional radiology can play a vital role in managing urological emergencies uh, uh, that you face with. They are able to provide effective and definitive minimally invasive management options. They're able to provide treatment for most urological emergencies. Most major tertiary care hospitals currently do have an IR department. So take the time to go and find out and say hello to them. And when in trouble, make sure you reach out to your friendly neighborhood intervention radiologist who may be able to help you in most of your uh, uh, urological emergencies. I'm sorry, I'm not available to take any questions, but if you need to reach out to me, please uh, find me on social media or on my website. Thank you very much. Hi, Dina. You can share your slides, please. So uh, I'm going to talk today about renal trauma. So obviously it's a topic that I can talk as much about or as little about as time permits, but I've tried to cover um, several aspects, including the epidemi epidemiology, evaluation and mechanism of the injury, um, the most commonly used grading that we use over here, which is the American Association of uh, Surgery for Trauma Grading, indications for imaging, a couple of case discussions, and some um, evidences that uh, I've looked up at. So in terms of the epidemiology, again, this will uh, vary geographically, but based in the UK, um, renal injury is about 5% of all the trauma cases, which is usually more common in the young. But interestingly, most of them are managed conservatively. And uh, we'll talk about the management a bit later on as well. Okay. Evaluation-wise, so um, just going back to where I left off for evaluation, um, just, uh, you know, kind of like the aspects that we should be covering. Obviously, it's going to be the um, ATLS protocol. But on top of that, kind of like the important parameters are like assessing the pre-existing renal conditions, um, if there's an opportunity to do this. Um, seeing whether it's a single kidney or bilateral kidneys, knowing about the mechanism of injury, and most importantly about the hemodynamic um, stability, and also whether there's any other, um, other injuries as well or not, and what's going to be the management of those injuries if present. Um, in terms of the mechanism of injury, broadly there are the blunt injuries and the penetrating trauma, and um, I've put, a, I'm not gonna talk too much about the surface anatomy or the anatomy, but the reason I've got that um, diagram over there basically is because as we all know, the kidneys are not exactly horizontal. They are oblique and um, slightly tilted. And that's actually quite important when you assess any sort of injury, because based on the location of where the injury is, you can kind of anticipate whether there's more likely to be a vascular injury or a parenchymal injury or, you know, no injury at all. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind, really. So the most commonly used grading that we use over here is the AAST grading, which is a validated, um, a validated grading system. And it helps us uh, predict the morbidity as well and assess uh, what kind of intervention we need to do or whether we need to do any intervention, in fact, in the first place. Um, very briefly, I do have the classification over here, but um, it's grades one to five, obviously, from the least um, serious injury being one to the most serious injury being five. Where grade five can either be completely shattered kidney or the avulsion of the renal hilum. Um, and again, uh, in terms of management, to be fair, whereas, whereas in the past we used to say grades one to three were conservative, four and five more likely to need invasive treatment. Um, I think more recently we can actually see that even grades four and five, majority of them are actually managed conservatively. So in terms of grading it, um, it will be based on imaging and the most commonly used imaging or the gold standard would be a CT scan. But the indications for imaging in the first place would be things like visible hematuria. In children, however, it could also be non-visible hematuria 
or non-visible hematuria with an episode of hypotension, which is classified as systolic blood pressure of less than 90. Mechanism of injury is also important. Um, if it's a rapid um, decelerating injury or fall from height of more than a meter, then this is considered to be significant, or if it's a penetrating trauma, or if there is, um, there is clinical evidence of um, hemodynamic instability, then also you would want to do um, imaging. So as mentioned, the CT scan is the gold standard, and a CT scan with contrast that we want with a delayed phase. The reason being for that is because in the three phases, in the arterial one, you can assess for vascular injury. In the nephrographic, you can assess for parenchymal injury. And only in the delayed phase can you actually um, assess for any collecting system injury. And without actually identifying all of these injuries, um, you haven't fully assessed uh, whether there is an injury or not, and you, you aren't able to fully classify the injury. Um, there are other alternatives of imaging, such as the ultrasound scan. You can't really grade for that, but you can use it to see whether there's any free fluid or hemoperitoneum. Um, but typically, we tend to get a, get a CT scan anyway. MRI scan as well is uh, equivalent to a CT scan. However, it's probably not as easy to get, not as easy to interpret, at least over here. So we rely more heavily on the CT scan. Uh, intravenous urograms, they are out of fashion over here in the UK now for you know, um, a &E assessment or things like that, but there are situations where it can be useful. So we'll touch on that topic a little bit later on. And in terms of renograms, it's not something you do as an emergency, but perhaps if you need to do follow-up for anyone, then this is where you would um, consider that. So just a couple of cases very briefly. Um, it's a bit difficult to do this as an interactive session over here. Um, so I'm just probably just gonna talk about it really. So this is a 45 year old man involved in a road traffic accident. And uh, clearly, as you can see from the picture, is there is significant bruising, there's abdominal tenderness, and there's also hematuria, uh, as we can see in the catheter. So this uh, gentleman has had a CT scan, and um, that's what we can see. So normally I would have asked what grading we think it is, but actually for the purpose of this discussion, I'm just going to give it. Uh, this is a grade five injury. Uh, in terms of management of grade five injuries, again, in the olden days, we'd probably say about whether you need to do an invasive treatment, such as an exploration. However, nowadays, it's really based on, I mean, grade five injury could be just shattered parenchyma through and through, or it could be a vascular revulsion. So on this one, it is just parenchymal injury. So in terms of a shattered kidney, if they're hemodynamically stable, if there's no other injury, then it's best to manage them conservatively. Avulsion of the of the pelvis, however, or the hilum, is a, is a different ballgame, and that will more likely need surgical exploration or other invasive treatment. Um, coming to case two, it's just an axial section of the CT scan, uh, and what that arrow is pointing to is extravasation of the contrast. Obviously, we'll need to roll through the rest of the images as well to see where um, how far the contrast is going down the ureter, but clearly this is at least a grade four injury. And typically for grade four injuries as well, in the past, we would automatically start stenting them. If they've got a urinoma, we would uh, think about putting in drains as well. But however, more recent evidence suggests that to be fair, if they're clinically stable, they're not septic, and uh, sorry, if they're yeah, clinically st uh, stable and not septic, then there is a role for, for conservative management over here as well. You don't necessarily have to go in and rush with stents and drains and things like that, unless they are deteriorating. So I will share the evidence for all of that in my later slides. Coming down to the third case, this is a 65-year-old pedestrian versus motorbike, uh, hemodynamically unstable, distended abdomen, and well, because they're unstable, it's suspected um, intra-abdominal bleed, in which case there was basically no time to get a CT scan. So this patient ended up in theater um, with no idea of, of exactly what, what will be the injury. But uh, as a urology registrar or consultant, you've been called in, um, and the findings noted are liver laceration, no bowel injury, but they've suspected a retroperitoneal bleed. Um, this is probably typically a case where you would probably still end up getting on-table intravenous urograms. Um, the alternative option would be if you have access to an ultrasound scan, you could still use an ultrasound scan as well. Now, you, you can't necessarily grade the injuries very well over here, but what you can do is as a minimum, find out whether they've got one kidney or two kidneys, because that's important. If they've got one kidney, you'll try your best to save it. I mean, two kidneys as well, you'll try to save it. But if you do an IVU, you can see whether there is any contrast extravasation. You can't tell whether there's any vascular injury or parenchymal injury potentially, but you can tell whether there's any, any, um, any uh, you know, grade four injuries. And then dependent on how they are, you decide how to manage. 
but in a gist, if it is a non-expanding hematoma, it's best left alone because if you do explore it, most likely they will end up with nephrectomies and it's going to be very difficult as well to see anything or to control any bleeding. Most often you can't find a source of bleeding as well or you cause it by simply opening up and um, removing the hematoma. If it is pulsatile expanding or the patient is uh, deteriorating rapidly, then you may not have an option than uh, going in and actually exploring the kidney with the ultimate aim being hemorrhage control. And again, over there as well, there's a 30 to 50 percent risk of ending up needing to do a nephrectomy. Uh, indications for intervention is if such as things like life-threatening uh, bleeding, renal pedicle avulsion, expanding retroperitoneal hematoma, solitary kidney or bilateral injuries, persistent leaks or infected urinoma, or if there's coexisting bowel injury. Now, if you have urine leak and bowel injury, you'll probably end up doing something about it because otherwise there will be persistent infection, sepsis, and further deterioration. Uh, as mentioned earlier, in terms of the aims of treatment, it's mainly about stopping the bleeding or maintaining hemodynamic stability, normalizing the flow of urine, and importantly, also preser preserving the renal tissue and function. Uh, this is actually straight out of the EAU guidelines about the management of renal trauma. It is quite self-explanatory, but the gist of it is that, first of all, assess the injury, stabilize the patient, and if the patient is hemodynamically stable, then you try and manage conservatively regardless of the grade of the injury. However, if it's a penetrating trauma or if it is an unstable patient, then they will likely end up with, uh, with, uh, with an intervention, either in the form of exploration or other, uh, other management such as embolization. Um, we've talked about most of these things already. Um, what I wanted to touch about over here is the third arrow where it says about repeat imaging. Uh, again, I find that um, over the course of my training as well, initially we used to do repeat imaging for most of the injuries apart from maybe grade one injury, but actually grade one to three injury, uh, depending on you know, the extent of it, you probably don't really need to do repeat imaging unless there is any specific indications such as infections or poor kidney function or solitary kidney. Uh, for the higher grades, however, uh, there's strong evidence uh, suggesting the need for repeat imaging, which is usually within two to four days, depending on how they are. And these are some of the indications. Follow-up as well is uh, more for the higher grade injuries, where you follow them up uh, in a couple of months time, mainly to assess for any complications or um, renal function. And this is where the renogram becomes important in terms of looking for page kidneys, hypertension, and things like that. And the complications are early and delayed, as mentioned. Some of the things included are an early perinephric abscess, fistulas, uh, urinomas, or infected urinomas. And in the delayed, it could be things like um, CD aneurysms, um, page kidneys, chronic palinophytis, even things like hydronephrosis and stones. Now, the evidence that I was talking about, these are, these are a couple of papers regarding the management, mainly to do with the high-grade injuries. There's a Lanchin paper in, tw in 2015 looking at 151 patients with grade four or five injuries. Again, here, about 98% were managed conservatively, out of which, well, non-operatively, out of which 82% were successfully managed, and 17 to 18% had other, in other management done, such as stent or embolization. Um, three patients who did have surgery ended up having a nephrectomy. So this basically fits in with the earlier discussion that we had. Then there is another paper by Bingoli two years later on, which did a meta-analysis on the outcome of the operative versus non-operative management. And again, really the gist of it here is that with operative management, there is higher mortality, which is why nowadays the trend is if they're stable, then you try and manage it conservatively regardless of the grade of the injury. Same year, there was also another paper by Colaco et al with the res retrospective analysis using the National Trauma Data Bank between 2002 and 2012. This is mainly the data bank for US and um, Canada uh, trauma, where um, essentially they've just um, noted down the difference in the trend of the management, and they've noticed a decrease in the rate of nephrectomy, both for penetrating and blood trauma to the figures that are noted, um, and a slight increase in the endovascular repair. And again, this also does vary in terms of uh, uh, geographically and uh, where the injuries are, what, what you're capable of doing. Um, then an earlier evidence by Alscafi, which reviewed patients with urinary extravasation. This is the paper where there were 34 cases um, looked at and they were managed conservatively, uh, despite the fact that they had urinary extravasation. 
uh, only 9% of them actually had persistent extravasation and needed stent insertion. And to be fair, all of them actually had res full resolution with just a stent. And the other 81% um, that were managed conservatively also had full resolution without needing any stent. So if they needed a stent, it was either because it was persistent extra extravasation or they had um, infected urinoma afterwards. Um, another paper in 2000 by Altman et al with analysis of uh, the grade five renal injuries is only 13 cases looking at the operative versus the non-operative management. And the overall summary over here again was that the conservative and the non-operative management uh, is a viable option in selective grade five cases. The select cases meaning um, the shattered kidneys without any pedicle injury. Pedicle injury is a different ball game, it's active bleeding. You need to do um, bleeding control over there. Then uh, the next paper is on Kehani et al. Um, this is, uh, they've designed a nomogram to predict the need for an intervention to stop bleeding in high-grade renal injury. And the kind of factors that they found that um, predict the risk of bleeding or increased risk of bleeding were hematomas greater than 12 centimeters, which is a penetrating trauma, or if there's evidence of uh, vascular, uh, well, contrast extravasation, perirenal hematoma extension, basically an extensive hematoma or an expanding hematoma, or if there's concomitant injury and shock. So these were what basically predicted the high risk of bleeding and needing uh, exploration. So with that, I'd like to conclude that over the past decade, the management of renal tra trauma has shifted to a more conservative approach, including that for the high-grade injuries um, and routine stent, stent insertion for urine extravasation is not necessary uh, and should be limited to cases where there is persistent uh, uh, urine extravasation or uh, complication as a result. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dina. That was a very nice presentation and thank you for your time and getting so much of evidences and also you're able to pick some nice radiology pictures. I hope it will be a very nice source for the trainees appearing in the exam. Next, I invite- Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Next, I invite Anish. He's going to discuss on emergency uretric and bladder injuries management. Anish, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and I thank you for this opportunity to present this emergency uretric and bladder repair. Uh, over the next 10 minutes, uh, and mainly this talk is aimed at postgraduates and earlier consultants, over the next 10 minutes, we will discuss on how to approach uh, when you are called on for these type of cases, either iatrogenic or traumatic, and how to systematically formulate a management plan, and what are the principles that we have to follow regarding the surgery or the management and the follow-up. We will discuss on the ureteric injuries first followed by the bladder injuries. The ureteric injuries uh, can be either present as iatrogenic injuries or trauma as part of the multidisciplinary approach. Uh, in the iatrogenic injuries, you'll be called as called in for a intraoperative consultation or the patient can present as a postoperative presentation. When you receive a intraoperative consultation for a iatrogenic injury, the thoughts should be like whether the patient is stable what is the operation done by the primary surgeon? What's the incision? What's the position of the patient? What are the indications for the, sur for the surgery? Is the table, uh, co it is compatible for fluoroscopy? What's the past history of the patient? Especially focus on to see if there is any previous history of any pelvic radiotherapy. What are the reasons that the surgeon is suspecting urinary injury? If the patient has got a catheter or not, what is the color of urine in the urine bag? If there is imaging, review the imaging for the urinary tract. Uh, maintain a very professional approach, assess and grade the injury. Very important to rule out concomitant injuries. If, if your expertise is limited, definitely call for a colleague for help. And uh, if you once you plan for the surgery or the intervention, carefully consider the consequences, whether it is an immediate or a delayed repair. And always involve the stakeholders in the decision making, which are yourself, your, the primary surgeon, the, your, your urology colleagues, if needed anesthetist and the family or surrogate of the patient because the patient will be under general anesthetic. Uh, once you decide on for the further proceedings, make sure that the theater staff is aware of the plan and use this ideal and best practice to use a separate timeout for the additional procedure. Confirm that all necessary equipments are available before uh, proceeding. And most importantly, once you finish, document all the findings and the reasons and your thoughts on the management clearly and never leave it to the primary surgical team. The gold standard to diagnose a ureteric injury is cystoscopy and retrograde study. 
cystoscopy alone is not sufficient because efflux can still be seen in a partial transection or a partial ligation. The other options that you can try is direct inspection with a ureteroscope. You can use interoperative excretory urography. You can use dyes like indigo carmine or methylene blue. But if none of these facilities are available, then use meticulous dissection and direct inspection of the injury. Once you diagnose the injury, then the next step is to grade it according to the AAST organ injury scoring scale 2018 update. And for the ureteric injury, it is grade one to five. Uh, if it is only a contusion, it is a hematoma. Depending on the transaction, whether it is less than 50%, then it is grade two. If it is more than 50%, it is grade three. And if it is aversion, and then if, it, and if, it, if the devascularized segment is less than two centimeter, it is grade four. And if it is more than two centimeter, it is grade five. Once you have all this information, then you have to think about the management. And it depends on the location of the injury, the grade of the injury, the mechanism, the patient characteristics, and most importantly, your expertise or your colleagues' expertise. The goals of the management are to preserve the renal function, minimize the mobility of the patient, and aim for early recovery of the patient. There are, some, there are certain situations in which you have to resort to temporizing measures when the patient is unstable or if sufficient expertise is, is not available or if the patient is presenting as a delayed presentation. If you decide for the repair, then you have to follow these principles of repair, which are to debride the devascularized, devascularized tissue, to create a spatulated, tension-free, watertight mucosa to mucosa anastomosis with an absorbable suture. Keep a ureteral stent, keep the omentum for interposition, and keep an external drain. For low-grade injuries, placement of a ureteral stent is preferred over a nephrostomy because of the decreased risk of stricture formation when you use a ureteral stent. The stents can be kept for two to six weeks. There is no consensus on, on how to proceed afterwards. In our hospital, what we do is after keeping the stent for between two to six weeks, we'll bring back the patient for a retrograde study. And mostly, most of the time, we will do a ureteroscopic examination of the anastomotic site or the uh, uh, structured site or the injured site. And then it will be followed by an imaging later in two to three months' time. Either it could be a delayed phase CT or a renogram as appropriate. For high-grade distal ureteral injuries, if the defect is less than two to three centimeter, you can use a end-to-end ureteroureterostomy. But most of the time, in these situations, the vascularity is compromised, in which case you have to uh, use the ureteroneocystostomy. There is no clear advantage between the non-refluxing and refluxing reimplantation. Refluxing is generally preferred because if it is, it is not time-consuming and it is efficient and the risk of obstruction is less in refluxing reimplantation. When direct reimplantation is not possible, you can use psoas hitch where the ipsilateral bladder dome is sutured to the ipsilateral psoas minor tendon. You can gain additional length by mobilizing more by dividing the round ligament or vas deferens as appropriate or free the bladder from the perivesical attachments by ligating and dividing the contralateral superior vesicular artery, the middle vesicular arteries and opening the contralateral endopelvic fascia. Uh, it is important to keep the suture superficial to the tendon of the psoas muscle because there are risks of nerve injury. The, uh, the nerves injured involved are mostly genitofemoral nerve and the femoral nerve. If psoas hitch cannot bridge the defect, then you have to resort to the powari flag, which can bridge up to 15 centimeter of defect depending on the capacity of the bladder. A small volume bladder is a contraindication for the powari flag. There are some principles to follow when you use Bavari flag for reconstruction, where you have to keep the ratio of length to base width like threes to ones. And then you can even mobilize the kidney downwards to gain the length. And most importantly, the flag measurements of a Bavari flag has to be taken when the bladder is not distended. The follow-up, the catheter is kept for one to two weeks time. It is a good practice to do a cystogram before removal of the catheter and the follow-up and removal of the stent is as described before. For severe grade three to five mid and proximal ureteral, ureteral injuries, there are lots of options available, but in an emergency situation, the best management practice is to temporize the patient because most of these surgeries are um, can, can cause permanent changes in the patient's body and even in the patient's health status. So that's why, and the, most of the time, there won't be any consent in place for these for, for these extensive procedures. So in these situations, the best practice is to temporize by using a nephrostomy diversion and 
defer definitive repair later. If it is a very severe or a complicated injury, don't hesitate to refer, refer to a tertiary center. A ureteroscopic avulsion injury is most commonly due to excessive force on a basketed stone. Again, if, if the expertise is available and if a proper consent is in place, you can resort to immediate repair or even reimplantation. But if these things are not in place, then again, the option is diversion and defer definitive repair. When you are called in for a trauma situation, this, the approach is different. You have to see where, whether, where the patient is, the location of the patient, whether the patient is hemodynamically stable, what is the mechanism of injury, whether the ATLS is already in place, observe the vitals, do a focused physical examination and review the lab data. Most of the time, we are part of a multidisciplinary team in a trauma call. In a traumatic uteric injury, usually this is part of polytrauma and usually this is present as a late presentation and the hallmark is extravasation of contrast in the delayed phase CT scan. In these situations, mostly we will have to go ahead with the damage control procedure where we will ligate the ureter and do a delayed repair. Coming to the bladder injury, the uh, causes of bladder injury could be trauma most commonly or iatrogenic. For the management purpose, the bladder injury is divided into intraperitoneal or extraperitoneal or combined. Uh, most common cause of bladder injury is trauma. The bladder injury is associated with pelvic fractures in 60 to 90 percent of the cases, and other intra-abdominal organs are injured in 44 to 69 percent. And most importantly, bladder injury is associated with urethral injury in 5 to 20 percent. That's the important of, importance of ruling out other concomitant injuries when you suspect a bladder injury. The iatrogenic bladder injuries is most commonly uh, caused by obscene gynae procedures. The risk factors for causing bladder injuries are history of previous surgeries, inflammation in that area, and malignancy. The diagnosis of bladder injury is clinically by observing visible hematuria. There are some absolute indications for bladder imaging, especially in pelvic fractures, and when there is disruption of the pelvic girdle, and when there is diastasis, severe diastasis of the pubic symphysis and posterior urethral injury. In these cases, you have to do bladder imaging. There are some relative indications for bladder imaging. We have to balance that one with your clinical judgment. The diagnosis of bladder injury is by cystography, either plain or CT cystography. You have to use 300 to 350 mils of dilute contrast material to see the leak of contrast material. CT is preferred so that you can identify the bony fragments or bladder neck injury, which will influence your management. Most importantly, the delayed phase CT urogram is not ideal. Again, bladder injury has got a AAST grading, uh, which was updated in 2018. I'm not going into the details of this one due to the uh, time constraints. Coming to the management of bladder injury, conservative management is preferred in uncomplicated extraperitoneal injury. Conservative management can be tried in uncomplicated intraperitoneal injury in the absence of peritonitis and ileus. For, there are some indications for operative management for extraperitoneal bladder, bladder injury when there is bony spicules in the bladder, if there is concurrent rectal, vaginal, or bladder neck surgery injury, or as part of the other procedures like orthopedic or surgical procedures. Intraperitoneal ruptures are mostly dealt with primary bladder repair. The principles of bladder repair are to identify the injury, if needed, extend the cystotomy, identify and avoid the ureters. The classic teaching is to do a two-layer closure with absorbable 2-0 running sutures, but you have to realize that it is not evidence-based and there is no evidence that two-layer is superior to watertight single-layer closure as per EAU 2021. It is a good practice to interposition the omentum, peritoneum, or perivesical fat for better healing and most importantly, test the anastomosis by instilling 200 to 250 mils of fluid and keep a large caliber catheter. The removal of the catheter is after two weeks. For a simple bladder repair, you don't need to do a cystogram, but for a complex repair, or if the tissues are unhealthy, like for, like for example, previous surgery, radiation or inflammation, keep the catheter for a bit longer, and then definitely do a cystogram before removing the catheter. That's the end of this, this topic on bladder and ureteric injuries. Thank you. Thank you, Anish. That was a very nice in-depth discussion on ureter and bladder injury. Salim Malik is going to discuss the post-operative sepsis and um, it post-operative sepsis is very common, especially after a difficulty ERP or a patient with a positive urine culture undergoing surgery. Let's see what is the presentation from Mr. Salim Malik. 
introduction. I am going to be talking to you all today about post-operative sepsis and infections in urology. As already mentioned, my name is Salim Malik and I'm currently a urology registrar in the West Midlands in the UK. So what I'm going to be covering in this talk is what exactly is sepsis, how can we prevent post-operative sepsis in urology, the use of prophylactic antibiotics preoperatively, then I'll go on to how we assess the septic patient, how to manage them, and finally some urology-specific considerations for the septic urology patient. So what is sepsis? Well, the internationally accepted definition of sepsis is defined as the life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to an infection. Organ dysfunction itself is defined as a SOFA score of two or more. Um, the SOFA scoring system is summarised in the image to the left of the screen, but essentially this takes into account certain parameters, which include your respiratory rate, platelet count, bilirubin, mean arterial pressure, GCS, creatinine and the urine app. There are several ways to assess the septic surgical patient, and one of these methods, which is taught by the Royal College of Surgeons, is the CRISP algorithm. So this splits the management into the immediate management by means of an A to E assessment, so assessing the airway, breathing and circulation, etc. The next step is a full patient assessment, which involves then reviewing the patient's notes, operation notes, results and charts. This is then followed by the step which is decide and plan. And this depends on whether the patient is stable or unstable. If stable, then a daily management plan should be formulated. If unstable, the definitive treatment needs to be decided or specific investigations in order to make a diagnosis. Before we explore the management it is important to recognise that post-op sepsis is not just about treating it, but also trying to prevent it from happening in the first place. In urological procedures, instrumentation of the urinary tract can increase the risk of infections. Therefore, the urine should be checked preoperatively for the presence of any bacteria or any UTIs. And ideally, they should be treated before we do an instrumentation. In addition to this, the World Health Organization have also published global guidelines for the prevention of surgical site infections, such as wound infections. These highlight 29 measures, 13 for before surgery, which includes asking the patient to bathe or shower before the day of surgery, and 16 for during surgery, which includes the use of prophylactic antibiotics, types of sutures to use, and the types of prep to use. This brings me on to the next section of how we can prevent post-optic sepsis by the use of prophylactic antibiotics. It is recognised in urology that some procedures are higher risk of infection than others. Diagnostic procedures such as truss prostate biopsy is a relatively high risk and antibiotics are advised pre and post procedure. This is because the procedure is done by the rectum which exposes the area to fecal flora. Flexible cystoscopy or urodynamics are relatively low risk so antibiotics are not usually needed but in high risk patients such as those with recurrent UTIs or those get infections after instrumentation, in these patients then antibiotics should be considered either before or after the procedure to minimise the risk of sepsis or infection. Going on to endourological procedures, usually for actual ESWL, antibiotics aren't usually needed unless there are risk factors such as an increased bacterial burden such as bacteria or presence of a stent or nephrostomy. Usually a single dose of antibiotics is given on induction for a TYBT and a eutroscopy. If there is a stent or nephrostomy, then additional antibiotics might be given. There is also strong evidence to suggest higher risks of infection after TYP and a PCNL. And the evidence also suggests that there is a significant reduction in risk of post-op infection in using prophylactic antibiotics. Open or laparoscopic surgery with the opening of the urinary tract have a high risk of post-op infections, so antibiotics can be used to minimise this risk. Similarly, with contaminated surgery such as iochondrite formation where bowel is opened. Finally, when inserting a prosthesis such as a testis or a penile implant, then antibiotics can also be given to prevent these from becoming infected. Now, moving on to the final half of the talk about the management of sepsis. So it's well recognised 
in the UK especially that the initial management of sepsis, ideally within the first hour, should be by sepsis 6. Now, sepsis 6 um, involves taking three things and giving three things. And the three things to take are blood cultures, measure the lactate level, and measuring urine output. And the three things that should be given are antibiotics, ideally within the hour and ideally before blood cultures are done, giving a fluid challenge to help with fluid resuscitation and hypotension, as well as giving high flow of oxygen in order to improve oxygenation of tissues. And this slide here just summarises all of this, basically, in the Surviving Sepsis campaign. And it's labelled as the hour one bundle because we know that doing these interventions within the first hour can significantly improve survival and reduce mortality. So as we can see, number one is measure lactate, obtain cultures, administer broad spectrum antibiotics, begin fluid resuscitation. And then the next step is that actually if you're not responding to fluid resuscitation, then to consider referral to critical care for vasopressor support. In addition to sepsis 6, there are other things that can help us with the management of a septic urology patient. Reviewing the previous urine cultures, for example, can help us to pick the correct antibiotics to give. Identifying risk factors such as the presence of a stent or nephrostomy, which may be blocked or colonised with bacteria. Particularly those with pseudomonas infections, these, these items such as nephrostomy, a catheter or a stent should ideally be changed. The procedure type can also help us select the correct antibiotics, for example, after a truss biopsy. Sepsis is more likely to be caused by fecal organisms, therefore this can dictate the correct antibiotics that we should be giving the patient. And I also just want to really stress the importance of source control. So it's very important to recognise where source control is needed. And by this, I mean that if there is a collection of pus or infected fluid, sepsis may not be successfully treated unless this is drained. Specific to urology, there may be a patient in urine retention which with infected urine requires catheterization. Following stone surgery, there may be an obstructive kidney which is infected. Now, this is a recognised urological emergency and the principles of management of this not only include the sepsis 6 and management of sepsis with antibiotics and cultures, etc., but also drainage of the kidney by either a stent or a nephrostomy. And going into more complex surgeries such as a cystectomy and ileal conduit formation, remember a section of bowel here is used to form the ileal conduit and therefore there is a bowel osteomosis that is made. It's important to remember that if this post-op patient becomes unwell, a differential diagnosis certainly would include an anastomotic leak and peritonitis. In a cystectomy or prostatectomy, there may have also been a lymph node dissection here. As a result of the lack of drainage of lymph, this can accumulate and become infected. This also need drainage to treat the sepsis. Usually speaking, these patients don't usually present in the immediate post period, but they may be discharged and come back with abdominal pain, distension, or sepsis as a result. And then imaging is done by means of, for example, a CT scan, and then this is all picked up. Drainage may also be needed in a urine collection, such as after iatrogenic urine tract injury and the formation of a urinoma. Again, this infected urine needs to be controlled to treat the sepsis. So in conclusion, sepsis is associated with a high mortality rate and its prompt identification and management is paramount in improving survival. Some procedures are recognised high risk of post-op infections such as a TURP, PCNL or trust prostate biopsies. The use of prophylactic antibiotics can significantly reduce the risk of post-op sepsis. Remember, previous cultures are very important in deciding the most appropriate antibiotics and source control of fluid collections may be essential in treating and controlling sepsis. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a very nice presentation from Salim. And I think uh, Dr. Leith Azwari is ready now. Leith, floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Leith Azwari. I'm here uh, with you today. Very glad to be invited to this great international collaboration with uh, mentors like you know, Mr. Dennis Sakrin. Uh, colleagues and friends from all over the world. Uh, my talk today will be on priapism, and penile fractures and AUS malfunction. So I have no disclosures. Uh, the outline will focus on updates related to clinical practice. Uh, when it comes to priapism, we'll focus on acute ischemic priapism, uh, 
European and American guidelines, uh, shifting to penile fracture, and we'll finish with AUS malfunction. As we, as we all know, priapism comes from priapus. He was the god of, uh, you know, uh, fertility and, uh, and gardens, prosperity in old Rome. He had the long phallus. So priapism, a definition by the most recent guidelines by AUA, SMSNA, uh, is a persistent penile erection that continues hours beyond and or is unrelated to sexual stimulation and results in, in a prolonged and uncontrolled erection. All patients with priapism should be evaluated urgently to identify the subtype of priapism, whether it's acute ischemic versus non-ischemic, and the ones with acute ischemic events should be provided early intervention because of the associated grave consequences due to the time-dependent and progressive nature of the condition, including pain, resulting in erectile dysfunction, negative effect on quality of life, and psycho psychosexual morbidity. For the non-ischemic forms, they do not require urgent information, and that includes stuttering and high flow. For the classification according, according to the European guidelines, ischemic or low flow priapism is persistent erection with the rigid phallus and soft glands with no or little arterial uh, inflow uh, and the erection is painful. For the arterial high flow priapism, there's a persistent erection due to unregulated cavernous arterial inflow. Uh, the erection may fluctuate, it's not fully rigid and it's usually painless and the patient may achieve full erection with sexual stimulation. For the stuttering priapism, it's many episodes, uh, short, usually self-limited with intervening uh, tumescence uh, that may, uh, may uh, you know, uh, progress to full-blown full, full blown ischemic priapism episode. Uh, when we talk about diagnostic evaluation in history, the key points are duration of the erection, the presence and severity of pain, previous episodes of priapism and how, what, how, how it was treated, if the patient has erectile dysfunction and what kind of medication is young, especially uh, intracavernosal injection, medications and recreational drug use, sickle cell disease, uh, hypercoagulable status, trauma to the pelvis, perineum, and the penis. On the physical exam, we'll focus on tenderness, rigidity, the status of the glands, signs for trauma, pelvic exam to assist for malignancy. Uh, when it comes to labs, we will order a CBC and a coag, uh, we may consider hemoglobin electrophoresis, urine toxicology, psychoactive drug screen. When it comes to imaging studies, we want to ascertain the blood flow with the penile Doppler. You may want to use an MRI scan uh, also to assess the corporal smooth muscle or the site of the injury and pudendal arteriogram in selected cases for high flow. Uh, as you can see, the long list of causes, I'm not going to go through all of them. And when we look, talk about medications that may be associated with the priapism, again, it's a very long list. Many medications can be associated with the priapism. When we talk about the differential diagnosis uh, as per the European guidelines, if, if, you if you have a patient presenting with an erection for more than four hours, we need to establish whether it's ischemic or non-ischemic. That we do that by taking history, uh, penile blood gas, and penile Doppler. So if the, pa if the patient has a painful rigid erection, the soft glands, and the blood gas shows dark blood, hypoxemia, and hypercapnia and acidosis associated with low or sluggish blood flow on the Doppler, then it's ischemic. On the other hand, if we have a patient who has a history of perineal or penile trauma with a fluctuating painless erection, blood gas shows a bright red blood and arterial blood flow or mixed with normal, normal blood, you know, with normal uh, uh, pulse wave on the uh, Doppler or a turbulent flow at the size of the fistula, then it's uh, it's not ischemic, it's high flow. Again, this uh, this slide from the AUA guidelines summarizes the the differences between the high flow and the low flow ischemic and ischemic cl clinically and on uh, arterial blood gas. You can go back to the guidelines for reference. If we look at the uh, you know treatment algorithm, the management for the European guidelines, they start with. Uh, penile block, we have to be kind to our patients. Then you insert a white bore butterfly, 16 to 18 goat, goat uh, through the uh, glands into the corpora cavernosa. And then you aspirate until you have a bright red blood. Once that is obtained, you can consider, uh, you know, intracavernosa therapy, but here they, 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 are, they are electing to do uh, cavernosal irrigation, which is not very encouraged by the uh, AUA guidelines, as I'm gonna show you uh, later. But we have to evacuate the clot and the old blood before we inject the pharmacological agent, which is filler friend. We give 200 micrograms every two to three minutes. 
maximum dose one gram per hour, and you have to have the, the patient on, on, on a monitor to assess the heart rate and the blood pressure. Obviously, in patients with cardiac disease and kids, you have to uh, lower the dose. If that fails, then you move to surgical therapy with chunting, and you may consider primary insertion of a penile implant. If a patient has sickle cell disease or trait, we will also consider or have to uh, add IV, hyd um, IV hydration and alkalinization, pain control, and supplemental oxygen. For the just the summary of the surgical procedures, if we for the distal uh, glandular corporal shunts, if we use a distal, uh, if we use a, um, a biopsy needle, it's a winter shunt. If we use a blade, then it's an abouage. If we move or twist laterally, then it's a T shunt. If we excise the distal corporal heads, it's algorab shunt. Now, if it's persistent, then we can use a, a tunneling technique where you actually pass a urethral sound or a Hagar through the uh, opening into the corpora to agitate the old blood and the clot from the proximal corporal bodies. Uh, just quickly go through the uh, various statements of the um, AUA guidelines. For the initial therapy, they uh, dictate that conservative therapies are unlikely to be successful and should, be, should, not, should not delay definitive therapies. And uh, the first line therapy are, uh, is the first line therapy is intracubinosal phenylephrine injection with corporal aspiration with or without irrigation. So irrigation is not, you know, a must. Um, and then if we look at, and, and if you use intracubinosal phenylephrine, then we have to ha monitor the blood pressure and the heart rate as we discussed earlier. Um, we should perform distal corpor uh, corporal glandular shunts with or without tunneling in patients with ischemic paraphrasm who fail pharmacological uh, therapy and if you just do distal shunting only and the patient fails again, you have to consider tunneling. Um, they actually retire the proximal shunting by saying that uh, it's, there's inadequate evidence of performing proximal shunts in patients with persistent acute ischemic paraphrasm after distal shunting. This is new. Um, and then when it comes to post shunting management, uh, patients with persistent erection following shunting, clinicians should perform corporal blood gas or a color Doppler, the Doppler to prior to repeating surgical intervention to establish whether the patient is still having ischemic priapism or actually has he has been converted into high flow priapism. We see that day in day and in daily practice. Um, and then we, when it comes to penile prosthesis, it can be considered in patients who had acute ischemic priapism greater than 36 hours because their recovery to erect normal erectile dysfunction is almost zero. And um, in that case, they would kind of gently push the clinicians toward delayed uh, placement of penile prosthesis versus early due to higher risk of complications. Shifting gears to penile fracture is a rare genital injury that's defined by the rupture of the tunica albuginea of the corpora cavernosa as a result of a forceful blunt or, or bending trauma to the erect penis. Usually we have the triad of history of trauma and then you have a patient with a a snap or popping sound, a penile ecchymosis, and immediate timescence, loss of erection. In about 10 to 20% of cases, there will be hematuria associated with possible urethral injury. Differential diagnosis includes a spinsery ligament injury and dorsal vein rupture. Um, in the, for the AO guidelines, they have very strong statements. Surgeons should perform prompt surgical exploration and repair. So all of these patients uh, ideally should be uh, explored. And then if you have an equivocal patient with signs and symptoms, you're not quite sure, you, might, you may perform an ultrasound according to the AUA guidelines in 2014. Uh, and then uh, if you have any signs of urethral injury, then you have to rule it out by a cystoscopy or a retrograde. For the European guidelines uh, in 2018, more recent, the only difference here is that they stated that magnetic resonance imaging MRI is superior to all other imaging techniques in diagnosing penile fracture. Uh, here we see an image, if you look at the red arrow, you see some leakage of blood from uh, the corpus cavernosal body, and the blue is on the corpus spongiosum indicating a urethral injury as well. So again, you know, the, the European guidelines kind of uh, agrees with the American in terms of excluding urethral injury uh, and also uh, treating uh, penile fractures uh, surgically. Uh, just for a summary of the surgical repair, uh, you will have to have exposure regardless of the approach, whether you use circumcisional, degloving, or penoscrotal evacuation of the hematoma. You identify the fracture site. Then you get good hemostasis. 
uh, thorough wound irrigation and debridement of devitalized tissue, and then you so suture the tear in the tunica albuginea and urethra repair if needed. There is no consensus of what suture material to use, but most surgeons will use synthetic absorbable sutures. And then patients will be advised to abstain from any sexual intercourse or self-stimulation for at least four to six weeks. If you have done a urethral injury repair, then uh, we would uh, leave the catheter for two to three weeks, followed by a pericatheter rug or a VCUG. Uh, lastly, we're going to talk about artificial urine sphincters, the AMS 800. Uh, it's the gold standard when it comes to male incontinence surgical treatment. It has excellent durability and high level of patient satisfaction. We have a cuff around the urethra, a pressure degrading balloon, and a pump. So I will focus on troubleshooting. What would you do if you see a patient with malfunction in AUS? As you know, there are many important factors can maximize positive outcome and minimize complications. Start with the patient selection and communication surgical technique and product performance. Uh, I would here reference you to the artificial urine sphincter report of the 2015 consensus conference. The ICS group had a meeting in 2015 and they had a panel of experts, 25, and they uh, came up with this great document. You can find it online. Uh, when it comes to post-op care, if you see a patient, you have to make sure that the catheters should be less than 14 French and should be removed as soon as possible overnight uh, to reduce the risk of cuff erosion. Make sure that the patients are on oral analgesia and has stool softeners to avoid constipation. Uh, they should limit physical activity for about six weeks. And uh, they must be uh, taught and must demonstrate the ability to how to cycle the AUS. And they have to, also you have to warn them that they should not allow anyone who's inexperienced to place a urethral catheter due to the high risk of causing injury and they should have a kind of medical bracelet. So if someone has an incomplete incontinence or partially functioning AUS, they may have many, many issues. That include technical issues with the device itself, or they may have a urodynamic voiding related issues or combination of the two. Just as, a, as an example, sometimes you, the you know, patients may have strenuous physical, physical exertion associated with the incontinence or post-maturation dribble, elevated storage pressures and blood uh, outflow obstruction overflow. Um, uh, sometimes the issue with the device itself, the reduction in the system pressure, there might be a large cuff or, or, or air lock, you know, there's a distortion or air bubble in the system. We should have a logical system of how we uh, assist these patients. So if we have a practical guide, so you have a patient with malfunction AUS, you examine the patient's protum, the ideal way to hold the pump is you use two hands, index and thumb on the tubing at the top of the pump, and then the other index and thumb on the soft part, which is the bulb. And then you have the hard part with the deactivating button in the middle. Now, if, if the first thing you do is you try to cycle the device by squeezing on the pulp, on the soft part, as hard as you can, and then it should become scaphoid, and then the, the urine, the cuff is, is, uh, is opened, and the urine should pass. If that doesn't happen, you can squeeze the side, you can squeeze the hard part of the pump sideways to pop out the deactivating button, because sometimes it can be locked. So let's say that you've actually at, uh, able to uh, activate the device, and then if you want, and the patient, if, if the patient is voiding, well, that's well and great. In the pump, you squeeze it, and you count till five, and then you press the deactivating button to keep it halfway opened. And then you can perform your diagnostic cystoscopy or place a very small catheter, 10 or 12 French. If you are unable to act to, de to deactivate or there's a possible urethral injury, then you can consider a cystoscopy or a placement of suprapubic catheter. If you can, then you call a friend and send somewhere they can look after the patient. Final slide, I just want to focus here on the initial workup. So we'll take history and physical, have a post void residual. We do UA, urine analysis. We cycle the device as I just explained to you. Then you observe the patient using the device. If the patient is in urine retention, if it's early, then you may want to lock it halfway open and then pass a urethral catheter and do avoiding trial in one to three days. If the patient fails, then we should consider uh, placing a superficial catheter or a revision later on. If it's a late uh, urine retention, then we will consider using doing uh, in-office cystoscopy and evaluating the coaptation of the cuff. And then uh, if there's good coaptation, then you, you might be the, consider UDS or a, a superficial tube some medical therapy, if it's poor coaptation, then probably 
we have, we'll have to get an axial imaging to check if the PRP is not leaking or do a revision. If there's an erosion, then definitely we have to explain the device and repair the urethra. And that concludes my talk. That's my Twitter account and my email if you have any questions. And thank you again for the, for the invitation. Thank you, Leith. That was a very in-detail presentation. It's difficult to prepare all the andrology emergencies in sub-10 minutes. And thank you very much for your tips and tricks on the AUS malfunction, a topic which was not discussed that frequently, but I think those who had an emergency and if they come across, this will be very handy. Thank you very much. Next, we have Dr. Anil Krishnan. He is going to discuss on the electrolyte-related emergencies in urology. Very dry topic, but he's going to make it very interesting with clinical scenarios. Anil. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, Anil. Okay. Hi, everybody. So, as Mr. Daniel Sakrin said, my name is Anil Christian. I'm a first year registrar currently working at New Cross Hospital in Wolverhampton. And today I'm going to give a short talk on electrolyte emergencies in neurology. Now, I'm sure this will be uh, a recap for most of you watching today. Uh, but the main goal of this presentation is just to uh, reinforce the importance of monitoring patients' electrolytes and also the fact that sometimes, as urologists, we may um, fall into the trap of jumping to treating the underlying pathology. Uh, and we may end up missing some life-threatening electrolyte abnormalities. So I've got two cases I'd like to discuss, and as we go through, I'll um, talk through the investigations and management of these. So the first patient is a 72-year-old gentleman. He's been referred by the GP uh, to SAU, something I'm sure we're all very familiar with, with a query of urinary retention. So his background history is that he's usually fit and well. However, of note, he has been referred in the last week by the GP for a two-week wait appointment with a PSA of 410. The patient, so when you, when you go to assess an SAU, complains of some gradual onset of lethargy and weakness, and now is not passing urine at all. So you examine the patient, his abdomen is pretty soft, and the bladder is not palpable. So, of course, the next step would be to order some basic investigations. So you take a VBG and some bloods. Uh, the VBG comes back uh, showing a mild metabolic acidosis, um, and then the blood panel uh, comes back from the lab as follows. So, um, as, as we can see here, the patient does have some marked renal failure, as noted by the and urea and GFR. However, we can also see that the patient is profoundly hyperkalemic. So just moving on to a few differentials of hyperkalemia. So first, uh, keeping our urological hat on, uh, in terms of common cause of obstructive uropathy, these may include urinary retention, and there could be a bilateral obstruction due to advanced prostate cancer, or the obstruction could be due to bilateral ureteric stones. However, it's also important to note other causes of hyperkalemia in the management, such as any medications the patient may be taking, any hormonal changes, or increased potassium intake as well. So moving on to hyperkalemia, and as mentioned, before we address definitive management of this patient, our first priority is to investigate and treat this as it can be potentially life-threatening. So hyperkalemia is defined as a serum potassium of greater than 5.5 and can be split up into mild, moderate and severe. Now, especially as, as the potassium levels increase, uh, there is an increased risk of uh, developing symptoms, which may include muscle weakness, uh, flaccid par paralysis or paresthesia. Now, severe hyperkalemia is a medical emergency and needs to be treated immediately, as does any hyperkalemia that um, shows ECG changes um, or if the patient's symptomatic. So first, moving on to our initial investigation and management, of course, we'd like to assess the patient uh, using an A2E assessment and to resuscitate them using ALS principles if required. Now, it's very important to repeat the potassium. Uh, that's to exclude a pseudo hyperkalemia, which you might get in cases of hemolysis of the blood sample. Now, I've put, put here a 12-lead ECG, and in particular, if the patient does have severe hyperkalemia, I certainly recommend them to have cardiac monitoring, as even if the, the patient has a normal ECG at present, that does not reduce the risk of them developing a life-threatening arrhythmia. I've also put in here that we should categorize the patient. The reason for that is twofold. Firstly, um, is, is for important to, develop, to uh, monitor the patient's fluid balance. But secondly, it may also help with our diagnosis. So if we're considering a obstructive cause of the, the renal failure and hyperkalemia, um, putting a catheter in, if, if there's minimal urine obtained, it might indicate that the obstruction is super cycle. So moving on with initial investigations, of course, we need to get an ECG. 
this patient. And I think this ECG really shows some of the key changes you can get in hyperkalemia. So we can see here that there's a more of a flattened P wave and that the T waves become tall and tented and there's a broad and bizarre QRS complex as well. And um, if, if we do not treat the hyperkalemia, this may prog progress to bradyarrhythmias and even cardiac arrest in some patients. So as we know, hyperkalemia is one of the reversible causes of cardiac arrest and patients can develop VF, PEA or racistomy as well. Okay, so what are the management principles of hyperkalemia? So I split these up into three simple steps. The first key step is that we stabilize the cardiac membrane. The reason for that is that hyperkalemia can decrease the resting membrane potential and increase cardiac excitability. So we give an infusion of IV calcium gluconate. The reason that it stabilizes the myocardium, but it's important to know that this in itself does not reduce the potassium levels, okay? What you want to do is monitor the ECG and, and look for normalization of the ECG. But if this does not occur, you can give a further two doses of the calcium gluconate. The next step is to drive that extracellular serum potassium back into cells. And the main way of doing this is to administer um, some, uh, some uh, short-acting insulin, such as Actrapid. Now, of course, that does increase the risk of hypoglycemia. So often this is given with an infusion of IV dextrose. So an example would be a 20% dextrose of 200 ml bolus. And this, uh, this again should be repeated. It's important that we do monitor the patient's potassium and um, both this as well as an additive effect from a nebulized salbutamol are both relatively short acting. And so repeated doses may be required. The third principle is that we could possibly remove excess potassium from the body. Uh, so calcium risonium already is one method of doing this. However, I do recommend that you speak to the renal or medical team before starting it as it's more of a long-term option. It's not suitable for all patients. Now, if despite all these measures, your, your patient still has a high, high potassium level, you might need to, to think of further, further management. And that might involve contacting the renal team or the ITU team to consider hemofiltration or hemodialysis. So I think if you do have a patient with severe hyperkalemia, I'd have those conversations early just so that the team are aware and that kind of the patient can be escalated if necessary. Okay, so let's say the patient's now stabilized, you've managed to treat them, the potassium's come down. Now is a point where we can safely continue investigations and more definitive management of the patient. So in this case, given the patient's renal failure, we order a CTKUB, which unfortunately comes back showing a locally advanced prostate cancer. And as you can see in, in the picture here, there is bilateral hydronephrosis. So we'd once of course order bilateral nephrostomies in this place to relieve the pressure and drain both the kidneys. Um, you can consider discussing the patient with your consultant at this stage and listen for an MDT and also starting some hormone treatment for the prostate cancer, such as an LHRH and Tadjax. Okay, so I hope that's all okay. I'm just going to move on to case number two now. Okay, so case number two, we have a 64-year-old lady. She has been referred to see you in the two-week weight urology clinic for a seven-centimeter renal mass note and an ultrasound scan. So you see this lady in clinic and perform your full investigation. So in terms of history and examination, sorry. And you see that she's complaining of some muscle weakness, palpitations, as well as increased urinary frequency and generalized abdominal pain. That's not just limited to the left flank. So given the nature of her complaints, uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate that we, uh, this is more of an acute problem. I don't think we can safely discharge this patient from clinic today. So we perform some initial investigations and here's a blood panel that you take from the patient and again, you do see that there is a deterioration in renal function here. But most importantly, of note, you can see that her calcium is raised, as well as the adjusted calcium, which is adjusted for the patient's albumin level. Given the patient's complaints of palpitations, you also order an ECG. And I think this ECG just gives you a good example of things to look out for with hypercalcemia. So um, in this case, you can see um, that the patient may develop J waves, and there may be a shortened QT interval as well. And again, the, the, the problem with hypercalcemia is that it can cause a, um, a reduction in um, cardiac uh, depolarization. It can uh, lead to a much increased risk of cardiac arrhythmias, which can be life-threatening. So it's very important to, to both recognize this and start immediate treatment before we think about more definitive management for the patient. So a quick recap of the role of calcium, as I'm, I'm sure we're all aware, it has multiple roles, which include things such as maintenance of the bones and teeth, has a very important role in the coagulation cascade, in muscle and nerve and brain functions, as well as enzyme and hormone release. Hypercalcemia itself um, can be defined as a serum calcium greater than 2.6, 
and again can be split up into mild, moderate and severe. Now, severe hypercalcemia is much more likely to be symptomatic and is defined as a medical emergency. Now, I put it that 90% of cases of hypercalcemia are related to either malignancy or a hyperparathyroidism. Now, the reason this is relevant in our case is with the patient uh, presenting with a renal mass, uh, we need to consider whether there's a possible paraneoplastic syndrome uh, going on as a complication of this. Okay, so moving on to some of the symptoms of hypercalcemia, and again, I'm sure we're all very familiar with a, a common rhyme, which is bones, stones, thrones, moans, and groans. And I think this image just nicely summarizes some of the key symptoms that we can look out for. And we may give us a clue either on the wards or in clinic that a patient is suffering from a high calcium level. Now, it's also important to note that with more severe calcium levels, such as a patient that we've seen in clinic today, they, the patient may be confused. There's also a risk as this progresses that they can develop a coma as well as life-threatening arrhythmias, as I've mentioned. Okay, so moving on to initial treatments, of course, given, given the patient's symptomatic, they have a severe hypercalcemia, we want to urgently arrange a bed to admit this patient. Now, the mainstay of management of hypercalcemia is actually IV fluids. So a number of patients, given the poly, polyuria, are profoundly dehydrated. So you'd want to replace the intravascular volume, and commonly we'd use um, an IV infusion of normal saline for this. And you can give, give this quite fast, so 300 to 500 uh, mils per hour or more, and you want to keep a good eye on the patient's urine output as well. Now, especially if you're concerned of um, fluid overload, perhaps the patients have an element of heart failure, you could consider a, uh, a diuretic, which studies show does have an increased, um, does it have to increase uh, calcium excretion as well. We'd like to give the patient some IV bisphosphonates, such as pamidronate as well. And as, as we probably know, um, this helps to inhibit uh, bone resorption via osteoclasts. And in a case like this, where we might be considering that the hypercalcemia is secondary to malignancy, obviously we're not going to be able to deal with that cause and line treatment straight away, the management of this. So you'd like to continue oral bisphosphonates even after the acute management. Now, again, similar to the hyperkalemia, um, you want to think about uh, an, an urgent medical or renal review early on. If, if the case is refractory to the treatment methods that you've, um, you've put into place, you might want to consider dialysis for this patient as well. So again, I think as well as the management steps, it's about that uh, open communication and um, making sure that the, the renal team are aware of the patient if need be. Okay, so, so again, just, just drilling in these principles, now that we've stabilized the patient, we may have dealt with their acute um, electroflight abnormality. Now we can move on to thinking about more definitive investigation and management. So in this case of hypercalcemia, you'd want to make sure that you, you obtain a full panel of bloods for the patient. This would include parathyroid hormone, parathyroid hormone related peptide, which may be raised in perineoplastic syndromes. But you, you wouldn't want to th um, miss any other important causes too. So this might include a myeloma screen. You'd consider, uh, continue the regular bisphosphonates, as I mentioned. And then you can look into further imaging. So, of course, we want to characterize that renal lesion by way of a triple phase CT scan. Consider a, a CT thorax, both for staging purposes, but also because any lung lesions or malignancies can also exhibit perineoplastic syndromes and cause a high calcium. If you're concerned about any bone metastasis, um, I think it would definitely be sensible to order a bone scan for the patient, looking for any osteolytic bone mets. And you could consider discussion with endocrine surgeons about any imaging of the parathyroid glands, depending on how your blood panels come back. Of course, once this is all done, you've stabilized the patient, add them to the MDT, and then you can consider some definitive treatment. So if the patient's fit enough, this may include a radical nephrectomy. Okay, so that brings my cases to a close. These are some references here. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Anil. That's a very difficult topic and you have made it very clinical so that it's more palatable and more understanding. Next, we have Dr. Tara Bernho. She's going to discuss on high pressure chronic attention and management of post obstructive diuresis. Thank you very much for that introduction. My name is Tara Bernhope, and today I'm going to give you an overview of high pressure chronic retention. And then we're going to look more specifically at post obstructive diuresis what it is, why it happens, and how we manage it. High pressure chronic retention is characterised by a residual volume of greater than 800 mils, and this causes renal impairment secondary to bilateral hydronephrosis. The intravesical pressure I'll come on to in a moment. 
Clinically, the patient may still be voiding. They may not notice that they have any urinary symptom, symptoms whatsoever. And that's because this is a condition that's built up over time. And so the bladder has um, increased in capacity and, and adjusted to that. Another presentation is patients may describe nocturnal bedwetting. And that's because the uh, resting tone of the sphincter is reduced during sleep. It's a painless condition, although if there is a super added insult, uh, such as a urinary tract infection, then an acute on chronic picture uh, may present, which can be painful. So the bladder is retaining an ever increasing amount of urine after voiding. And so at the end of a void, there is an increased intrapocycle pressure. And when the bladder then fills, the pressure rises even further. There's a great paper from Professor Abrams um, from the 70s, which where he performs urodynamics on um, a, a cohort of patients with retention and splits them into low pressure and high pressure groups. So the normal rise in detrusor pressure from an empty bladder to full capacity should be less than 15 centimetres of water. And he found that the mean increase uh, in detrusor pressure in the high pressure group was 85 centimetres of water. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no universal definition. Um, there's no numerical value for uh, diagnosis of um, a high pressure retention, although some textbooks talk about an intrapocycle pressure greater than 30 centimetres of water. Um, so that's just to give you a bit of an idea of, um, of the difference that we're talking about here. Hopefully there's nothing on this slide that surprises you. The acute management of high pressure chronic retention is prompt catheterization and expect very large volumes in the order of litres. The most I've seen is a patient retaining four litres. Always document the residual volume, document clearly that the catheter must not be removed and explain these points to the rest of your team and to the patient as well. Um, in particular, explain to the patient that decompression hematuria is likely, um, as that can be quite a frightening uh, thing to observe if you're not expecting it. The definitive management, I'm not gon going to go into, um, but it's either long-term catheterization, intermittent self-catheterization, or some sort of outflow surgery. Moving on now to post-obstructive diuresis, and this is defined as a urine output of greater than 200 mls per hour for two consecutive hours. There is a physiological component and there may be a pathological component also. The physiological diuresis is a normal physiological response to the volume expansion and solute accumulation that occurs during obstruction. Sodium, urea and free water are eliminated and as, the, as fluid homeostasis is restored, the diuresis ends. A pathological diuresis may then ensue, and that's characterised by inappropriate renal handling of water or solutes or both. There are a number of mechanisms by which pathological diuresis can occur. There is defective generation of the medullary solute gradient, secondary to reduce reabsorption of sodium chloride by the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and reduce reabsorption of urea by the collecting tubule. There's also an inability to maintain the solute gradient because of increased medullary blood flow, and this causes a solute washout. There's also increased endogenous production of atrial natriuretic peptide, causing a saline diuresis, and a poor response of the collecting ducts to antidiuretic hormone. All of this can result in a worsening renal impairment and electrolyte abnormalities, the most common being hyponatremia. Now I'm going to talk about the management of high pressure chronic retention once the patient has had a catheter inserted, remembering that we need to be vigilant for a post-obstructive diuresis. So the first step is that these patients need to be monitored very closely. Um, they need hourly urine output monitoring and monitoring of their fluid inputs. They need a minimum of four hourly observations, including heart rate and lying and standing blood pressure to look for any hemodynamic instability um, and postural drop. 
and may need daily weights, again, to look for any gross fluid shifts. Similarly, urea and electrolyte blood tests need to be taken regularly, and the patient may need a venous blood gas um, to assess for acidosis as well. Depending on the level of the renal impairment, this may need to be multiple times a day. Hopefully by the time that you're seeing the patient as a urologist, they will have had some upper tract imaging to assess for any other cause of renal impairment. Medication review is something that um, can sometimes fall to the bottom of the list, um, but it's important to check that the patient is not on any nephrotoxics, diuretics, antihypertensives that may be making the situation worse. And also PPIs, um, it's important to remember that they can exacerbate a hyponatremia, so you may need to stop that temporarily. Where a diuresis has been identified, fluid needs to be, re be replaced at a rate lower than the urine output. The literature varies with recommendations to replace, um, some say 50%, can, uh, other papers say up to 90% of the urine output over the following hour. Uh, Additionally, the literature suggests 0.45% sodium chloride. However, in practice, we often use normal saline 0.9% um, as it's more readily available. My current practice is to give half of the preceding hours urine output over that hour. So for example, if the patient voided 500 mils over the previous hour, I would give 250 mils of normal saline over the following hour. And, and this would need to be adjusted accordingly. Giving too much fluid um, can perpetuate the diuresis. If things aren't going to plan, don't be afraid to escalate to your friendly local nephrologist. Uh, particularly if you have a prolonged diuresis greater than 48 hours um, or worsening renal function or persistent electrolyte abnormalities that you're failing to control with conservative measures. Uh, these patients may require um, specialist fluid regimes or renal replacement therapy in the worst case scenarios. Finally, I just want to mention a few scenarios where um, you should be very alert to the prospect of post-obstructive diuresis in these groups of patients. Patients who are fluid overloaded with congestive heart failure, peripheral edema, hypertension, patients with severe renal impairment, or patients who have CNS symptoms that are commonly associated with hyponatremia, um, so malaise, nausea, headache, irritability, and confusion. So to conclude, my take home messages for this talk are that the first step of management of post-obstructive diuresis is recognising the problem. These patients need very close monitoring and you may need to impress the importance of that upon the rest of your team. Caution those patients with fluid overload, severe renal impairment and CNS symptoms as they are the most likely to have a poor prognosis. Thank you very much. I hope you found this useful. Thank you, Tara. That was a very nice presentation. This is one of the very life-threatening situations if it is not managed appropriately. Well done and very nice protocols for various electrolyte uh, management. I will say off of the volume replacement by hourly monitoring and 0.9% uh, normal saline is an ideal choice. Half normal saline will add only more confusion and it can result in a bit of a more fluid overload also. Next, we have uh, Mohammad Tahir Malik. He is a consultant urologist from Pakistan presenting on scrotal emergencies. Malik, floor is yours. Please unmute yourself, sir. Hello, hi dear. Hi everyone. Can you hi. hear me now? Yes, Malik. Yeah, you can share your slides. I share my screen. Can you see my slides, Dr. Anand Kumar? Uh, not yet, Malik. Try again.
Yeah, we can see now. Just uh, make it full screen, please. Is it okay now? Well done. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Mohammad Tahir Bashir Malik from Pakistan, and my short talk will be about testicular torsion and testicular trauma. So, to start with testicular torsion, this is one of the few clinical situations which will quickly assess your response to the emergencies, reliance on your clinical findings, your communication skills, and emergency decision making, especially when it involves uh, salvaging or removal of a vital organ for the boys. Uh, going through quickly through acute scrotum differential diagnosis, a long list is there torsion, scrotal edema, orchitis, varicocele, or hematoma, and many more to see. Many down. So, when you are approaching a patient uh, with the suspected testicular torsion, you may ask a few questions from yourself Is it torsion? What is the variety? Is it a viable testis? Should I investigate or just explore? Or should I remove the testis or fix the testis? And you will get the answers of all these questions from history, physical examination, and investigations. You know, uh, the uh, testicular torsion has bimodal distribution from uh, perinatal, pe perinatal period and in puberty. And perinatal period is extra vaginal variety, and in puberty, it's uh, intervaginal variety. Typically, the, the patient, the boys, present with sudden scrotal pain with vomiting, and 70% of them present within 12 hours. However, uh, the presentation may be delayed in uh, prepubertal boys because of atypical presentation. You must differentiate testicular torsion with the features of vomiting, which is common in torsion, fever in epididymitis, absent cremasteric reflux uh, in uh, torsion, and pain on ovulation also in the torsion. Please remember, normal urinalysis does not exclude epididymitis, and abnormal urinalysis does not exclude testicular torsion. Although the diagnosis of torsion is essentially clinical, however, in case of any doubt, you may seek uh, guidance from top ultrasonography, which has sensitivity of 3 to 100%, and says there's a specificity of 97 to 100%. However, it has limitation of uh, operated dependence and misleading arterial flow in early phase of torsion. And please remember, persistent arterial flow does not exclude testicular torsion, and a comparison may be made with the other healthy testes. High resolution testes, uh, high resolution ultrasonography may directly visualize the spermatic cord twist, uh, which is called Whirlpool sign, and it has sensitivity of 97% and specificity of 99%. Although not commonly uh, performed in practice, scintigraphy and MRI may be performed to confirm the, diagno confirm the diagnosis of testicular torsion. After making a quick diagnosis, proceed towards the management. The first step is to perform manual detorsion, which is uh, like opening a book. For the right testis, you will rotate it on the left side, and for the left testis, you will rotate it into the right side. You may also get Doppler ultrasound guidance while doing manual detorsion. However, every detorsion attempt should be immediately followed with bilateral orchidopexy. Urgent intervention is indicated in all the patients who present within less than 24 hours. However, if the patients have already passed more than 24 hours, semi-elective exploration with concept, consent of a carotomy should be done. In case of uh, viable and non-viable testes, it's always better to perform archaeotomy because it results in better sperm morphology later in life. Determinants of early salvage rate of the testes are time between onset of symptom and detorsion and degree of cord twisting. So you, you must consider these two things before uh, while managing the patient. Managing torsion appendix taxis, uh, usually non-operative, uh, non uh, is uh, done only with anti-inflammatory analgesics. And surgical exploration is performed only in equivocal cases or if there is persistent pain. Moreover, there is not, it's no, uh, there is not uh, uh, bilateral acridopexy is not required in torsion of appendix testes. While dealing new nets with torsion, treat them in a similar way like you are treating pubertal boys. In the, the follow-up, the major concerns are infertility, subfertility, and testicular atrophy. Subfertility happens due to direct injury to the testes or post-ischemia reperfusion injury. However, if the patients are managed within 12 hours of uh, torsion, the fertility will be preserved. Regarding atrophy, if there is uh, more than 360 degree 
twist in the spermatic cord, there is high chance of testicular atrophy as compared to 180 degree, uh, degree or less than that. These are the European guidelines, summary of evidence. And I will strongly recommend to go through this uh, review articles, which uh, addresses uh, the controversial issues regarding testicular torsion. I will share this link in the chats. To continue with the second part of my presentation, testicular trauma. By the time you have been called for, by the a &E physician to manage a patient with testicular trauma, uh, most of the time the a &E physician will have, uh, have already applied ATLS principles. And once you reach the patient, you should know the time and mechanism of injury, exact nature, determine exact nature of testicular injury, your plan, do, uh, should we need to intervene? And at intervention, do you need to remove the testis or reconstruct and not to miss other injuries? These are the important considerations while approaching a patient with testicular trauma. These are the few mechanisms uh, which uh, end up in uh, testicular trauma, blunt injuries, which is the most common, and motor vehicle accidents in cycle or bike, sports, machine injuries, assaults, or firearm, or even sexual intercourse. What may happen in testicular injuries, we expect these uh, few testicular injuries, hematocel, traumatic dislocation, which is bilateral in 25% of cases, testicular rupture, which happen in 50% of cases of direct branch clotter trauma due to intense compression of testes against the inferior epigrammas or PR symphysis. And finally, the avulsion, which is due most common in the machine injuries. Evaluation obviously start with the history and physical examination, a severe sudden pain with nausea and vomiting and sometimes fainting, hemiscrotum is tender, swollen, acromotic, testes may not be palpable, Bladder catheterization is usually required in these patients and urinalysis should be performed, but in, in the presence of uh, visible hematuria due to some associated other injury, you may also need to perform retrograde urethrogram. The diagnostic study for uh, testicular injury is uh, ultrasound and uh, to differentiate from hematocele contusion and rupture of the testes. Heterogeneous echo pattern of the testicular parenchyma with loss of contour definition is a highly sensitive and specific radiographic findings and mentioned in the figure, uh, radiographic finding for testicular rupture. We can also utilize Doppler duplex ultrasonography to get information about testicular blood flow. And if these fine investigations are inconclusive, you may proceed to CT or MRI of the testes. After establishing the nature of injury, proceed toward the management individually according to the nature of injury. For testicular dislocation, manual replacement should be followed by orchidopexy. Laceration should be primarily repaired. Scrotum has a good elasticity, but in case of extensive loss, you, need, you may need complex and stage reconstructive surgical procedures. Small hematoceles can be managed conservatively. However, large hematoceles require surgical, early surgical interventions for collateral equation and sometimes orchiectomy. And please explore all equivocal cases whenever, whenever imaging studies cannot definitely exclude rupture. For a documented or suspected textural rupture, the treatment is always exploration, debridement of necrotic tubules and tunica cloyer, evacuation of clots and hematoma, and the cloyer of tunica albuginia with absorbable sutures. For penetrating injuries, you will always require surgical exploration with debridement. In case of uh, disruption of spermatic cord, we can, uh, you can realign with the, without the vasostomy. However, if there is, uh, the patient is unstable or reconstruction cannot be achieved, orchectomy is indicated. For animal bites to the testes, local wound management with antibiotics is required, and you also need to give anti-rabies vaccine or immunoglobulins to uh, these patients. In case of homer bites, transmission of viral disease may occur and post exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis B or HIV may be required for the patients. The concerns in the long-term follow-up include abscess formation, psychological effects, erectile dysfunction, urethral disease, infertility, chronic testicular pain, testicular atrophy, and testosterone, testosterone deficiency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malik. That was an in-detail presentation. Again, testicular trauma is quite rare. 
but when it happens i think we should know the principles of trauma care next we have lohit uh, a radiology consultant who is familiar to the group and he's going to discuss the role of urology emergencies and role of radiology in them yes lohit thanks ananda um, i want to share my screen all right so um, hello everyone um, uh, i am uh, lohit ambadipudi uh, a consultant radiologist based in the uk so now um, all the previous talks uh, have uh, alluded to uh, a lot of uh, radiology um, in uh, these urological emergencies so now that has made my job a lot easy and um, so we're going to uh, see a lot of uh, pictures uh, and how uh, imaging can help now um, we have a lot of uh, modalities at our disposal but uh, ct ultrasound mr uh, are the main ones uh, we use uh, ct is the mainstay uh, ultrasound is definitely the first line investigation um, in many cases and is the investigation of choice for uh, scrotal pathologies and uh, for penile fractures uh, mri would be the uh, imaging modality of choice now um, based on the etiology i can um, uh, try to pick a modality uh, that would be uh, optimal um as i said ct uh, for most cases and uh, ultrasound uh, um in in specific cases and also as a first line now coming to trauma um there are based on the site of injury um uh, there are different types of uh, scans that can be ordered that can be requested and um uh coming to uh, ct protocols specifically tra for trauma now there are two main um uh, protocols that are Uh, used in most institutions uh, world over uh, the first one uh, is a multi phase ct um, that uh, has been discussed previously uh, a pre contrast study is done followed by multiple phases of uh, post contrast scans uh, that gives uh, a detailed uh, arterial anatomy uh, parenchymal anatomy uh, and also delayed the phases for the uh, collecting system now um uh, in uh, most of uh, uk um, a single portal venous phase contrast ct is performed uh, as a whole body ct for example in cases of polytrauma and uh, a delayed phase can be added if collecting system injury is suspected um yeah, and um, a ct urography uh, is done specifically when uh, you know a query is directly raised about ureteric injury and not Uh, polytrauma um say a stab injury or uh, you know post uh, iatrogenic post surgery now um the last thing ct cystography is um specifically for bladder injury it's done separately um uh, we'll talk about it uh, in the next few slides now um the grading of uh, renal trauma has already been discussed how it helps management i'm just going to show you the pictures the, on the left is a grade 1 renal injury showing a small uh, subcapsular hematoma in the middle is a, a left renal grade 3 injury with a very deep laceration and um, subcapsular hematoma this is a shattered kidney you can see completely transected at the level of the renal hilum and um, now um this is a stab injury um uh, to the back with a knife uh, that's the ureter and that's the pool of contrast uh, which is coming out of the ureter that's the normal left ureter this is a post hysterectomy case uh, with uh, incomplete uh, left ureteric injury that's the site of injury this is the contrast coming out this is the bladder which has this foley's bulb in um i said incomplete because uh, it's not a complete transection i can see some contrast flowing uh, into the distal ureter now um uh, yeah we were talking about cystogram ct cystogram is done separately from or after uh, a, a you know trauma ct when uh, bladder injury is suspected when there are lots of pelvic fractures because pelvic uh, there's a high association uh, for uh, bladder injury now on the uh, left hand side is an image uh, uh, which is a ct urogram um, uh, basically a contrast ct was performed uh, and then a delayed uh, sequence uh, uh, was obtained uh, where you can see contrast in the bladder and lots of pelvic i mean pubic fractures are seen here lots of fat stranding and some gas here but there is no discrete uh, contrast leak from the bladder 
Now, uh, later on, a CT cystogram was performed uh, by instilling contrast retrogradely into the bladder. And now you can see a lot of uh, contrast which has uh, come out. So this is extra peritoneal uh, bladder rupture. Um, uh, this is another case of extra peritoneal bladder rupture. That's the bladder with the Foley bulb. And you can see the rent very clearly here anteriorly and a lot of uh, contrast uh, extra peritoneally. This is a case of an intra peritoneal rupture uh, in a female patient. That's the uterus. And this is the bladder. And this is the big rent uh, in the dome of bladder. And you can see Foley's going beyond the dome into the peritoneal cavity um, and with contrast uh, basically filling up the um, peritoneal cavity. Now, um, so this is a CT cystogram. Now, um, they, we do come across uh, non-traumatic uh, cases of uh, 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 hemorrhage, uh, retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Uh, this is such a case where uh, there is left renal uh, hemorrhage and uh, surrounding uh, perirenal retroperitoneal hemorrhage. That's the active contrast leak in an arterial phase. That's the aorta. So in the same patient, actual images, you can see the kidneys here, uh, compressed, flattened, pushed up. And that's the active contrast leaking into the subcapsular uh, large hematoma. And this is the uh, retroperitoneal space, which is again filled with a lot of bleeding. Um, so this is spontaneous in this case in an old gentleman. Um, uh, spontaneous hemorrhage can also happen uh, in um, uh, tumors. Um, uh, for example, uh, there, there's a large angiomyolipoma, a lot of fat content. And this is the retroperitoneal hematoma. Again, another AML in this case on the left side, a uh, lot of uh, bleed in the retroperitoneum. Um, uh, so, role of interventional radiologist is uh, we've uh, we've already seen that uh, heard the talk uh, where uh, uh, how the interventional radiologist can help uh, embolize and uh, stop the bleeding in these cases. Now, uh, coming to penile trauma, um, um, uh, well, it, essentially the diagnosis is clinical and uh, imaging uh, basically helps in planning the surgery. You know what kind of uh, incision, uh, the extent of incision. So we can, uh, we can, radiologists can provide the uh, site uh, of the uh, tear of uh, tunica albuginea, uh, the uh, dimensions of it, and the you know size of the hematoma, and uh, if there is a urethral injury. Now, ultrasound is equally good, but it has its uh, limitations because of um, operator dependence. There's, you know, you need certain level of expertise, and also because the patient will be in severe pain, there will be a lot of swelling. Um, the finding may not be uh, accurately uh, delineated. So MR would be considered uh, the investigation of choice. But again, if MR is not available in low resource settings like India, uh, ultrasound definitely, um, um, in the Indian subcontinent, ultrasound expertise is really good in, in almost all places. Now, um, <clears throat> retrograde urethrogram can be done uh, if there is a urethral injury, can be done post-operatively and then repaired later on. Uh, now, let's see some examples. Uh, that's a rent in the dark tunica albuginea of the um, corpus cavernosum. Uh, same patient, you can see the coronal image, you can see the rent, and that's the large um, uh, hematoma uh, to the side of it, and that's rest of it is all uh, edema. Now, another case, again, you can see a clear rent. You can measure the size, you can tell on which side, if there are multiple rents. You can, uh, you can see um, there's a, in the same patient, you can see this uh, rent defect here and uh, a hematoma forming next to it. Now, uh, we've just heard about testicular torsion. Yeah, diagnosis is uh, essentially clinical and uh, ultrasound can definitely help, but um, uh, it is uh, it has low sensitivity and it is uh, very specific. So if I find torsion on ultrasound, uh, then it is uh, it is definitely there. But if I don't find torsion or if I find, uh, you know, good vascularity in testis, that doesn't rule out torsion. So again, uh, time is money or time is the most important factor. So um, 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 we've heard in the first talk that, you know, uh, emergency exploration is the, uh, is the uh, standard in UK and, um, and, you know, waiting for an ultrasound uh, basically delays and we should not uh, be doing that. A uh, few examples, normal right testis, left testis is swollen, uh, slightly darker, no vascularity. Uh, here, uh, it's the right testis, which uh, doesn't show any vascularity. Now, this is a case of uh, mm, uh, a, a false negative case. Now, this is a whirlpool sign, which is highly sensitive and specific, which basically shows us the twisted spermatic cord. But you see that the test is still shows uh, uh, good vascularity. 
Um, so this is uh, because I've seen Whirlpool, I'm going to call it that there is Whirlpool sign, which is suggestive of torsion. And anyway, um, um, he should, the, this patient should be taken for uh, surgery. Now they say that, uh, you know, less than 360 de degrees of twist um, um, means you could still see vascularity in the um, in the testis and more than 360 up to 720, the vascularity is, uh, because of the tightness, the vascularity goes off. But again, um, so trying to check for vascularity is not a good thing and uh, well, pull sign is more specific. The consequence of torsion, this is an infarcted testis compared to the normal right testis. Swollen, um, darker uh, fluid areas forming, again, uh, right side testis here, example. Now, um, a mimics or a differential diagnosis, this is a normal right testis and head of epididymis, abnormal enlarged head of uh, left epididymis, um, and uh, which is uh, hypervascular. This is acute epididymitis. And um, similarly, orchitis enlarged uh, hypervascular uh, uh, testis will be seen. And uh, this is another uh, mimic. Um, this is a torted uh, testicular appendage. Um, this is the torted appendage. This is the normal testis. That's the appendage which is torted, bright one. And you can see the ep uh, epididymis separately, which is normal. And uh, uh, there, here you can see that all structures are separate and that um, um, is the diagnosis. Now, um, ultrasound, as I said, is the investigation of choice for all kinds of scro scrotal pathologies. This is a case of a blunt testicular trauma showing uh, contusion, um, avascular area, um, testicular ruptures, hematoceles, all of these can be diagnosed on ultrasound. Um, 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 now, moving on to sepsis. Um, CT is the investigation of choice. Um, yes, ultrasound can be used uh, as a first line of investigation and in follow-ups and um, Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see a few cases. Um, um, now, contrast CT is the uh, investigation of choice, but if it is contraindicated for, uh, you know, uh, iodine allergy, or then ultrasound can be used uh, or can be replaced with MR, MRI. But um, mm, uh, let's see a few CT cases. This is a classic case of acute pyelonephritis showing wedge-shaped areas of uh, uh, high point, reduced enhancement in the kidney compared to the normal left kidney. That's acute pyelonephritis. So this is consequence of uh, multiple repeated episodes of pyelonephritis, uh, say in a severe diabetic. This is extensive scarring bilaterally. That's chronic pyelonephritis. Now, uh, again, one more consequence of um, um, renal uh, infection is a formation of abscess. That's an abscess. And that's the dilated renal pelvis that is secondary to a stone. So this is obstructed um, case with, uh, you know, secondary infection and abscess formation. Another case, um, renal abscess, right renal upper pole abscess complicated by um, hepatic um, extension to the liver and formation of a small hepatic abscess. Now, uh, another case, a large left um, renal abscess. Uh, you can see that uh, it was... Uh, uh, drained um, uh, using CT guidance. There's a catheter which was uh, left in uh, in this case. Um, another case, you can have multiple small abscesses. So um, you know you can discuss with the radiologist if uh, if any of these can be drained uh, uh, under image guidance. This, for example, this could be. Uh, we can put in a needle in this. Now, um, pyonephrosis, obstructed cases with uh, secondary infection. You can see that there is hydronephrosis. This is the kidney. And the dilated system has got very echogenic, uh, thick, uh, uh, met pur purulent material. That's pyonephrosis. Now, xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis is not an acute uh, condition. It's a chronic process, but it's it's it has a lot of uh, uh, you know infected focus uh, within. So um, um, nephrectomy is the choice, uh, but imaging can uh, help guide you if there is uh, you know extra renal extension of the sepsis. Uh, we would always see a, um, a staghorn calculus and uh, in, for example you can see the abdominal wall collection in a case with xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis uh, again you can see it in psoas abscess uh, that's the staghorn and this classic appearance is called the um, paw sign like you know like the paw of the bear um, again one more example now Emphysematous pyelonephritis is is got a fulminant course, and uh, if not a treat, if not treated early, you know, um, there's a high chance of mortality. 
Now, the characteristic feature is gas, gas within the renal fossa. And you can see different examples, different appearances, mottled gas, uh, you know, pockets of gas. This is within the renal pelvis, uh, forming a small uh, air fluid level. This is within the parenchyma. Now, uh, it's, you know, gone out of the capsule. It's going into the thing, uh, going into the retroperitoneal fat. It's going to the other side. But the left perinephric space is clear. So, left kidney is not involved. Now, uh, uh, sepsis in the prostate, you know, um, it can happen in pro de novo prostatic abscesses, post, uh, post uh, instrumentation, post surgery, can, it can also happen. Ultrasound is, um, is usually sufficient um, to diagnose prostatic abscess, a transrectal ultrasound. Um, you can even uh, uh, do an pro interventional procedure draining these abscesses. This is an MR image uh, showing uh, left uh, half of the gland containing an abscess. That's the catheter. And this is CT uh, showing uh, prostatic abscess. That's the bladder. Um, now, um, obstruction, I, um, I have not uh, uh, put in uh, lots of examples, but uh, um, in the UK, uh, CT KUB uh, without IV contrast is the, um, is the first investigation that is performed in cases of uh, acute uh, uh, urinary colic. Um, in India, um, uh, ultrasound is as good as, uh, uh, it, there is enough evidence to say that ultrasound is uh, as good as uh, CTKUB. And there is uh, this ACR consensus, which shows, um, you know, similar uh, consensus with ultrasound and uh, CTKUB. Uh, now, um, some examples, this is a uh, right PUJ calculus, there's hydronephrosis here, mm, here a uh, ureter calculus, distal ureter near the uh, ureterovesical junction, um, so ultrasound or CT, um, and uh, now take home points, um, contrast CT is the main stay for uh, urological emergencies, uh, except for, uh, you know, scrotal pathologies and penile pathologies and, uh, testicular torsion. Yeah. Um, uh, do not delay, uh, intervention, uh, for, um, ultrasound Doppler, but, um, is essentially clinical and, uh, yeah, radiology can definitely help in in most cases. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Lohit. That was a very in-detailed presentation. I think the recording of your talk will be most wanted by all the exam-going trainees. All the pictures were so clear and uh, you have demonstrated the whole urological trauma possibilities. Thank you for your time. Thank you. This is the end. All good things need to come to an end. And we had such a wonderful faculty who covered all the emergencies in detail, organ by organ, including the radiology colleagues jumping in and giving a very helpful hand. Next, I call upon Professor HOD, Dr. Lakshman Prabhu, who is from Mangalore Medical College. He will give concluding remarks and also the MCQ in the details. Lakshman, sir. Uh, hello, everybody. I would say that, you know, we had 10 stars and all of them performed so well. Congratulations and thank you very much. It was a learning experience for me too. So in my comments, you may find that uh, I may expose some of my ignorance, which I did not know. And I'll be only touching upon those points which uh, appeal to me. In the first talk was very crisp and uh, a lot of information. And most of it was, I think, uh, uh, of medical legal importance, especially in the ERs and uh, residents should, uh, because that's the starting point where they ought to know all these studies. But the most important thing is that when it comes to torsion, do not refer, fix the way you like. You know, any technique is good enough, but there is no time to refer. Then the interventional radiology by uh, Dr. Salil, uh, well, I was uh, amused, you know, I never thought that uh, we can produce an AV fistula after orchidectomy, uh, which can be troublesome, which appealed to me in addition to most of the other interventions which I had uh, shown. And uh, I thank him for a wonderful exposition of the subject. Uh, renal trauma was very well covered. And I think the famous principle, I think still, so, uh, still holds good, protect and preserve and conserve as much as possible. But when you can't, you end up losing the kidney. And that's the message, I think, you know, standing tall even today. Then we had uh, emergency ureter and bladder repair. Uh, when it comes to ureteric injuries, uh, it, more often than not, these are intraoperative consultations. And here, the message is, 
involve the stakeholders so that we uh, we need not uh, keep on repeating the same cock and bull story to each and every one who comes and questions us. And the rest of the things were beautifully covered. Andrological emergencies were very nicely covered. It was uh, covered very well by, like, thank you very much, sir. And uh, uh, the important thing is when it comes to penile fractures, maybe uh, use MRI. And of course, all the relevant things were covered. And uh, post-op sepsis, uh, we learned that prompt attention to sepsis saves lives because it's a high mortality condition. Electrolytes, I think the famous statement, bones, stones, groans, moans, and I think we have to add thrones also now. Constipation is another angle added. Very well covered. And uh, when it is uh, high pressure chronic retention, recognition, monitor, and caution uh, in select groups, I think uh, Dr. Anand also added a couple of points. And this is something which should be watched for. And uh, testicular torsion, testicular injuries were very well covered by Dr. Malik. And the lesson here he has given, I think, you know, this came in uh, most of the presentations that persistent arterial flow does not exclude torsion. And in the last talk, we also learned that more than the vascularity, it's the whirlpool sign, which uh, draws our attention to, you know, probably strengthens our suspicion of torsion. Um, uh, with that, I think I would say, I will say 10 speakers, 10 stars, you did very well, and I'm sure most of you are so crisp that I don't think there is any room for confusion. I think I would like to view all these and listen to all these videos once again. And once again, thank you because it's two hours. And uh, uh, like I was told that 13 attendees participated in the quiz. And I'm happy that a Mangalorean has uh, won the contest, you see, from my own city. And Dr. Nandakishore, but from Mangalore, Karnataka, India. Congratulations. Dr. Nandakishwar. Thanks once again over to Anand, I think, for the final, I would say, whatever time of the day is to our international speakers. Uh, thank you very much. I joined my hand. Namaste. And uh, it was great being with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lakshman Prabhu. I really appreciate every speaker and the time spent not only in PowerPoint presentations, getting the images, and this whole webinar was arranged in a record-breaking two weeks' time. Thank you for the cooperation and I'm sure the speakers will be again invited in a similar podium. I wish yes. the speakers to hold on after completion of this session, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Thank Anand. you all. Yeah, thank you, everyone.